I personally think it would be kind of fun if we kind of just touch upon the M14 and how that was morphed into something that so many I, people hate. I actually had one. I had one of the Marine Corps issued DMRs exactly. uh, back in the day when yeah. it was built off an M14 platform. And uh, right. Fred, I've used your uh, M40XB and uh, all your other <laughs> various goodies. So fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, that uh, those those M14s, man, what a uh, <laughs> bro! That's what a, a that's nightmare! A... <laughs> a, a nightmare of tolerance stacking, <laughs> trying to build them and actually feel them. <laughs> let's, and, let's... and I think that right there is a wonderful topic because what the military had is they had the they had these weapons, they had a purpose, and they said, "Well, let's see if we can do this." <laughs> and all well, I hear are negative into a bad do. gun. <laughs> Well, we just, you know, garbage in, garbage out, because the military hadn't bought M14 parts in 50 years, and we had to use what was just left in the oh system. Right? Holy shit. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, it, it literally was. It was all those lots of parts that they just weren't perfect, but they also, they still met the specifications, and they were just languishing in armories around the world yeah I, I will say the uh like the 2002 ish models of the marine corps finally came out like for for what they were they were pretty damn good for you know bullshit parts they were pretty damn good guns i mean there were no ar-10 but for the day they were fucking pretty legit <laughs> the m14 is a delorean of the uh semi-auto battle life world it looks fucking great <laughs> One's like ah, garbage. Yeah, I hate it. <laughs> heavy as ten motherfuckers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then depending on what chassis you put on, you just made it that much heavier. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh. That's, 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 not, not only heavier, parts, but I ran. Yeah, you know, I was issued one of those uh, M thirty nine EBRs, and I went to the school. Yeah. And, you know, help to teach it, and, and dude, to take those things apart for field strip and clean and put them back together is. Oh. As in absolute futility. Um, like, what's where's your torque wrench? What torque wrench, right? It's like looking for a headspace <laughs> and time and age when you got a mod to use, right? And uh, there's so many little screws and little parts just trying to get that thing to get back in that Sage chassis was, I mean, I think I'd rather close my dick in a car door than try to do that again. <laughs> At least you're honest. Lucky Gunner carries ammo for sale and only offers in stock cheap ammo with fast shipping. Whether you're looking for rifle ammo, handgun ammo, rimfire ammo, or shotgun ammo, you've come to the best place on the internet to find it all in stock and ready to ship. Lucky Gunner also has the popular Lucky Gunner Labs, which provide side-by-side -side comparisons of the best defensive ammunition available today. If you need ammo, and really we all do, check out LuckyGunner.com. Overwatch Precision is a team of civilians and combat veterans based in Phoenix, Arizona, that employ industry-leading production methods, coatings, and materials in their striker-fired polymer-framed pistol trigger systems. With an internal engineering team focused on thoughtful design, Overwatch's flat-faced and curved triggers safely deliver a mechanical advantage to your carry or duty Glock, Walther, CZ, P10, and Smith & Wesson MMP 2.0 with improved function and increased accuracy. See more at overwatchprecision.com. Filster makes awesome holsters. But not only that, they also happen to be one of those companies that are trendsetters. A lot of their designs are emulated by other companies. Not only does Filster make those holsters, but they also provide concealment systems like the Enigma, the Flex. They also have a lot of solutions when it comes to concealment solutions for medical. If you need to have a concealment first aid kit, they happen to sell them. Check them out at filsterholster.com. Are you a professional looking for a reliable and high quality rifle suppressor? Look no further than Primary Arms Government, whether you're equipping a team or shopping for your personal rifle. Primary Arms Government offers a complete selection of field proven suppressors with options to fit any rifle and any budget. They work directly with the industry's leading brands to secure the best prices and available inventory, and their expert staff is always available to answer any questions you may have. Don't compromise on the safety and effectiveness of your equipment. Choose Primary Arms Government for all your suppressor needs. Visit them online today at Primary primaryarms.com slash government. Walther is the performance leader in the firearms industry. Renowned throughout the world for its innovation since Carl Walther and his son Fritz created the first blowback semi-automatic pistol in 1908. 
Today, the innovative spirit builds off the invention of the concealed carry gun with the PPK series by creating the PPQ, PPS, and the Q5 match steel frame series. Military, police, and other government security groups in every country of the world have relied on the high-quality craftsmanship and rugged durability of Walther products. Walther continues its long tradition of technical expertise and innovation in the design and production of firearms. For more information, visit waltherarms.com. Hey everyone, Matt Lanfer here with Primary and Secondary. Welcome to Modcast. Today's episode number is 403. We're going to be talking about special purpose rifles, aka SPRs. This is a Gun Nerds episode. This is Gun Nerds 20. We are going to just be focusing on this. We're going to be talking about some history. We have some people that have some experience with this. And we're going to talk about where things, where the SPR has gone. And it's kind of cool to see how some of these concepts have been adopted competition, law enforcement, and all kinds of other places. Uh, today's date is October 3rd, 2024. Uh, my background's in law enforcement. I've been doing the cop thing since last century. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, see a, uh, I see a niche for SPRs within law enforcement. Absolutely. Where I live in northern Utah, we have some big, wide-open spaces where having fairly decent distances between where our last point of cover to where our objective or where our house or whatever the target is, they happen. They are, we absolutely have farmland up here. Um, I see a per, I, 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 I see a purpose for this. And I see also as well with uh, low power variable optics on patrol rifles. I see there's kind of a mesh where there's so much applicability and it's, it's cool compared to when I started. Yeah. We're running irons. And now then we went to red dots and then magnifiers and LPVO. And it's, it's awesome time to live when there are so many very cool options. Now the, the real trick is to wade through all those options and figure out, okay, what applies to what my needs are and what fits within the department budget and all that other. So we'll start talking about that stuff before we do that. We'll do some uh, backgrounds. Before we get into backgrounds, I'll say my favorite thing that I forgot to say in our explosives episode just a couple nights ago, and that is make sure you're support make sure you're supporting those sources that you have found to be beneficial. What I mean by this is pay attention to who these guys are and what they represent. Whatever, whatever company, if they have a page, uh, you name it. If you like what they're saying, you probably need to give them a follow. If they're sharing some insights that help you understand something better. Or maybe they even shared something that provides a better perspective where you you have a, a, a new a, a new perspective that probably deserves a share. These algorithms that we are actively working against because they don't work in our favor um, are kind of are, are, are they're they're definitely limiting our our distribution. So use the listener viewer get to help us out by being the algorithm. So when these guys are talking about whatever companies they're they're associated with, if you're liking what they're saying, make sure you're giving them a follow. Make sure you're giving them a like. Go do that whole share thing. That goes with everything primary and secondary. Uh, we've been doing this. Let's see here. Primary and secondary has been around now for 10 years. Um, it is awesome to be able to provide these kinds of conversations that wind up help. Well, they help they help agencies. I get I get emails and messages from various agencies saying, hey, this discussion helped us narrow down, narrow down some, some, some options, or it, it opened our eyes to things we need to consider when we're considering whatever, but it is wonderful to be, uh, uh assistance in that manner. So let's get some backgrounds going. Fred. Yeah. All right. Background time. Background time. So yeah, I've, I've not talked a lot about this when I've been on these others, but so I came to NSWC Crane to the uh, the schoolhouse there in 2008, and wasn't long after that I took over teaching the SOCOM uh, sniper weapons maintenance course, and uh, did that till I think 2015 or so before I made my jump to night vision, and uh, but so that's. Uh, I can provide a great, you know, historical background. Yes. I've not been, I've not been in the gun world, uh, since like 15. So, you know, all of my information is horribly dated, but, uh, it's and so that's, applicable. But, you know, I'm, 
Yeah, I'm I'm easing out the door into just a uh, a life of uh, running around in the North Woods and uh, trying to start my own bushcraft school as my retirement side gig. So, and that's Scarlet Fire Bushcraft, and sure could appreciate some some views and such. Heck yeah, heck yeah, and that historic aspect is incredibly important because. If we don't pay attention to that, what are we bound to do? Repeat it. So we, yeah. we have to learn yeah. that history and we have to learn about where we were and what worked and what didn't like the M14. Yeah. Alex. Hey guys. So Alex Hardman, uh, founder, CEO of Ridgeline Defense. I've been on, I don't know, pretty much every precision related PNS modcasts, probably from the beginning. Um, the SPR you know, for me, it's one of those things that uh, we're probably really well known for as a company, especially on the employment side for the last few years. Um, you know, it, it kind of started for me the first time, you know, I uh, got to a sniper platoon, got through sniper school, got deployed, and we fell in a bunch of Mark 12s. And I was like, what, what is this? Uh, I like you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, came back from that deployment and decided to like build my own of what industry had to offer that, uh, that time. I put it together, felt real fucking proud of myself for figuring something out and discovered it looked a hell of a lot like a mod H and I was like, Oh, somebody else has been here before. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, quite honestly, it's just been kind of a love affair, uh, with the platform, uh, and trying to, you know, in the last couple of years, perfect the platform as we've run out our, our own line of, uh, of light precision rifles. Um, I think it does a fantastic job to your point for domestic law enforcement it fills a lot of gaps and a lot of roles that people have probably overlooked at it. Cause you know, they don't understand the true ballistic nature of uh, intermediate barriers and what they would or would not do regardless of, of caliber. Um, but, you know, it does a lot for us, you know, as a force multiplier um, domestically, it's a lot for us as a force multiplier overseas. Uh, I consider it, you know, I'm, I'm not like that guy that's going to say there's one gun to rule them all, but if there's ever one that got really fucking close uh, it'd probably be a well set up, uh, you know, SPR. So, um, I'm kind of a, a nerd about them where they came from, from sort of before programs of record back when it was just, uh, armorers in, uh, in the back of team rooms doing, you know, things off the books. Uh, and there's a couple other guys that I wish were, were on here tonight that have some insight, you know, firsthand experience, but I'm fortunate enough to have been given that secondhand experience. Um, and yeah, you know, I look forward to, uh, kind of nerding out about this stuff with you guys. Cause it's a, uh, it's a passion project for me for sure. Cool. Yeah. I just recently rewatched your, uh, your surefire video talking about SPR stuff and it's near and dear to your heart. And so when and talking to a couple people about, Hey, this is who's going to be on the panel. I just sent them that link. I'm like, Oh, okay. <laughs> Eric. Uh, Eric again. Sir. Yeah. Again, uh, twice in a week. Um, 21 years army 14 and eod uh, i came into the spr thing from the cloner perspective i had a mod h upper sitting around since uh i was at bragg back in 2015 and then um 2020 deployment to syria kind of saw the benefits of started with the lpvo and then i was like man what if we free floated this what if we took the m4a1 barrel and then free floated the rest of it like really actually like got the most out of it and to kind of piggyback on what Alex said about like, you know, this is like the one that gets it as close to right as possible. I think the SPR platform does it. And then it's just a matter of pick and play for parts to get the lightest weapon possible. Uh, so I, I became a convert to it. And in my community, I'm trying to like sing the praises of at the very least an SPR style upper. And uh, hopefully before I retire, I'll, I'll get some traction on that, but we'll see. Cool. And Clay. I'm the uh, new guy here to primary and secondary, but uh, I'm Clay Martin. You can find me on Twitter. I'm at, uh, my thing is at, at way off the res, uh, former Marine scout sniper, uh, urban sniper graduate. I was a recon Marine. I did those things. I uh, got smart and cross deck the army. So I came green beret. Uh, sort of level one graduate, went to a uh, SIF sniper troop and spent most most of the rest of my time there as a uh, a SIF sniper. So depth of experience with both SPR and SR-25. 
taught level one SODIC and then also kind of uniquely as a contractor taught the uh, Marine Corps Urban Cyber course over in Japan for a uh, third SOTG. So, uh, man, love SPRs. It's funny. I had I, I was more of an SR25 guy when I was in my 20s and early 30s because I was a lot stronger and <laughs> bigger and stuff. Uh, <laughs> But having like that long career depth of experience, you know, most all my buddies pretty much are, are other snipers and stuff too, have a, a significant exposure to the SPR and definitely really think about it as I get older, going down to that smaller frame and how much more useful it is for so many situations. And uh, yeah, man, I, it's funny. Eric called me and there was a bunch of people asking me about SPRs over on Twitter. And I found out there's gonna be a, a, a guy here that I helped build. I was like, okay, that's it, we're in. And so- Excited to be here to talk guns. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. Yeah, especially on the, on the cop side, pretty much we all have some form of an AR. Why would we not go in that direction when we already have, we're, we're used to the, the controls. We have the ammo. We have most of the parts. We have the mags. It's not like it costs that much more to make one. Mm -mm, mm -mm. <laughs> really? And I remember talking to local uh, 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 SWAT sniper guys about, hey, yeah, have you guys even considered something like this alongside your Remington 700? No, 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 no. Okay. I'll just shut up then. And now, well, yeah. where are we now? So, Fred, <laughs> tell us. All right. Tell us about, so what's your earliest experience of how all of this started with you? Getting into the SPR. Um, figuring out what, what goes where it was uh it was definitely you know uh, uh, it started when i was uh working for uh, the state department and you know we uh you know there was a lot of cross pollinization um you know we there was a uh, I think it was a, a 20th group ODA in Maryland that was almost all federal agents. And, you know, they, so they, you know, they had exposure to the early SPRs and they came to, uh, you know, all of the, the firearms training unit, us there in the armory wanting these. And so that, uh, that actually caused me to, get back, you know, get in touch with Crane and find a bunch of guys that uh, that I had uh, worked with as a support guy for 7th Group when I was on active duty and eventually led me to get to Crane. But, uh, uh, you know, it was the, uh, you know, it did. It started with mostly with just a lot of home-built upper receivers. Um, I say home-built, but, you know, yeah. in the team room built, you know, and, uh, guys just really trying to, uh, you know, fix a problem without a lot of, you know, bureaucracy and red tape. And, uh, so that eventually, you know, that, that special purpose up a receiver became part of the SOP mod program. And there were, uh, well, two things happened. One, they discovered a whole bunch of M16 A1s um, that uh, they started using to build this were when it transitioned from an upper receiver to a whole uh, whole weapon system. I guess the first thing was uh, they discovered there was a bolt bounce issue when uh, you put that SPR upper receiver on a carbine lower and sometimes things just wouldn't uh, wouldn't work right so that combined with discovering all of these uh, unused a1s that you know were in a warehouse next to the Ark of the Covenant or something like that and, and so that was it was those you know two things is how the special purpose upper receiver turned into the mark 12 SPR and you know, I don't know what whether the bolt bounce issue has been uh, fixed with, you know, it's probably been fixed in the civilian world and you can get everything tuned and you don't have that issue. So. Cool. And Alex, you were saying you've, you had similar experience 
working in team rooms, throwing, throwing stuff together and see what sticks. So secondhand accounts from way back in the day, right? So starting like late eighties, early nineties at the command, um, there were armorers there who were literally taking carry handle M16 uppers, machining or you know, band sawing the carry handle off and then machining it flat and then drill tapping and mounting weaver bases uh, onto those so that they could mount scopes yeah. to them. So, and, and, you know, uh, I know like the, the term recce rifle is yeah. kind of replayed out and a lot of people, you know, in the community now like look down upon it as like, oh, well, like what's a recce rifle? Anybody doing recce is this? Like, got it. But the connotation comes from back in the day at the command, the recce troop was doing this kind of off the books, making their own stuff. And that carried across to other tier one assets. And that's really where the Mark 12 program, you know, originally, you know, to um, Fred's point, originally it was an upper receiver group, um, first and foremost, before it became a full-blown uh, weapon system and program of record. And, um, you know, at, at that time, it, it was it was a hell of a lot more like a mod age for what we see nowadays. And it actually looks like a mod one, right. With an 18 inch rifle length back in the day, it was much more 16 inches um, and whatever gas system they could get away with in the day, usually a carbine length, which is why the bolt bounce thing was such an issue. Um, Cause once you put that can on there and you start actually, you know, increasing the carrier flight velocity, you're going to start to see those issues take a, take a effect. Um, but from there, you know, it went and it, you know, generation, generation. And then after, you know, what was it? The 2004 drop of the assault weapons ban and industry could finally really go to work. So many more options, so yeah. many more parts and accessories came to be. Um, you know, we talk about like nowadays, you know, one of the things that we talk about with like using the Viltor uh, A5 buffer system. So the A5, that was a program, a record from the Marine Corps in the mid 2000s. Like I remember my, when I get in a Marine Corps time sitting in Stone Bay, reading about the A5 is, you know, the gunners were trying to create basically what was the Colt C7, C8 for, for the Marine Corps with a 20 inch barrel on a, on a, you know, adjustable budstock, but getting that length back in a collapsible version. So, you know, I can fast forward a couple of years, you know, 2012 running around Afghanistan, you know, I had a, an M4A1 out ripped. Uh, I had that stupid like mod one loophole, like two and a half to eight scope that they had on it. Machine gunners got issued the CQBSS. <laughs> I stole a CQBSS, put it on top of the Mark 12 upper, slapped on my M4A1 lower. And uh, we were out on a, uh, you know, at the time I was running a police transition team. So it was like me and like 12 Afghans. And uh, we were running, we were supporting a platoon and my gunner was on the, on the mission too. And he looks over and he goes, Sergeant Hartman, like what in the fuck is that? And I was like, what are you talking about gunner? And he looks at it and he goes, where where did you get that and i was you know played stupid and whatever and uh eventually he goes well, who's gonna figure all that out if you get hit and i was like well gunner it won't be my fucking problem and uh <laughs> nowadays i see him you know, he works in the industry now too and we joke about it to this day because he's like you were such a pain in my fucking ass but at the end of the day it was about hey i can i can you know beg borrow and steal these different parts slap it together and and make it work so it kind of was what it was but um that was kind of my from the very beginning and then kind of finishing up in my own way of of popping a couple pins and stealing a couple things to to kind of do the same thing it, it, to me the 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 coolest aspect again is to see where we are now and looking at the options that were around then compared to now, it's absolutely amazing. The, the just the sheer amount of, of options that are available that you can do so many different things, different levels of magnification, you name it. It's just, well, it's also amazing. It's not just the other, uh, I know this is a gun nerds episode about, you know, so it's mostly going to focus on equipment and stuff, but it, it, what really what really is starting to push that leading edge in the development stuff of this is that we've never known or been able to extract the level of accuracy and precision that we have until today with the optics that we have, the parts that we have, the ammunition that we have, and honestly, the training and experience that we have. There's things that we're talking about today that, you know, we're, I think uh, Clay was talking about running SR 25s back in the day. And, you know, I had a Mark 11 back in the day and then a 110. And, you know, I've got an SR 25 now. And 
Now, I remember when those, uh, you know, back in the day when Blackwater transitioned from M24s to SR25s for the DDM program for, um, and, and a lot of guys lost their qual because they couldn't shoot a gas gun. And, you know, the reality is nobody really knew they, they gave them gas guns because they realized that gas gun was what we needed for OIF, right? You had uh, lots of moving targets, which as a community snipers are not very good at, you know, um, we just, the, the amount of ranges with moving targets and how, like we're getting better, but it's never like it, it, we never get the amount that we need to make it truly intuitive, especially for guys coming out of school. <laughs> Uh, we had moving targets, limited exposure targets, usually darting across the near danger areas. So they had, you know, limited exposure time and it was kind of P for plenty and hope for the best. Right. So if you had to run the bolt, you were, you know, losing one to 1.5 seconds per shot. You weren't able to just kind of like hunt those guys down uh, because again, they blended to the local populace. So, you know, when they did show themselves, it was whack-a-mole time. Um, you know, but because guys didn't know how to run gas guns, they weren't talking about things like thermal shift, positional shift, you know, uh, magazine follower tension, bolt carrier tilt. Like there was a lot of things that guys didn't understand on the equipment side because we we couldn't shoot the equipment well enough well before the equipment wasn't good enough. And we're at a point now as a community where guys are seeing these things show up in combat and competition and now we're also able to go to industry and find the material solutions to this to backstop the training solution to that. And I think it's, I don't want to say it's one or the other, and I don't want to necessarily say it's leapfrog, but it's like, we're kind of incrementally pushing each other. The better we can do, the better more we can learn, the better yeah. we can do, the more we can learn until, you know, where we're at now and where we're going in the future. Well, I remember a conversation we had on the podcast not too long ago talking about, okay, we're pretty much, we're almost end of life with 556 five, with what we have. Maybe it is time to go look at additional calendars or calibers. That being said, we, we had a discussion talking about uh, 308 as an interim rifle years ago and how, eh, um, yeah, Pressburg had some wonderful quotes with that one. Yes, Eric? It's my favorite episode. Uh, I'm actually going to touch <laughs> mentioned in that episode, uh, completely unrelated to uh, the the whole debate, but tangentially related, uh, so to speak. So, Clay, you didn't necessarily agree with that. No, it's uh, there's actually, I mean, there's multiple good points there that just came from uh, from this whole discussion. I would like to get back and talk about the transition from uh, bolt guns to gas guns. Oh, heck was so yeah. Important. And, heck yeah. Uh, I mean, this was, but before we do that, I just want to ask Fred a question where we're still talking about the early parts of the gun. I've seen the drawings for the Gen 1 handguard from the guy that made him. And I won't say his name because he's a competitive shooter, and I don't know if he wants that out there. But am I am I correct now that that uh, uh, was it Precision Reflex Inc. is making, did they make the handguard that actually yeah. went on the uh, the original SPR? On the mod zero, the, when it was mod zero, mod zero. Mod I'm talking yeah, the old round one with the holes and yeah, carbon fiber. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mod awesome. mod zero and mod age. Very cool. I've actually held in my hands the first the prototype from the guy that made it, and then I uh, sent you know the drawings wherever off, which was very cool piece of history, uh, in, in my opinion. Um, to the other point about gas guns versus bolt guns, man, that was so. Let's be perfectly honest too. The SR twenty five and I'm not a big fan of Knight's Armament. I don't think a lot of guys have carried Knight's Armament or big fans of Knight's Armament. Their accuracy was, it was just, it was crap. It was not there. But the stuff that we get today, man, five, five, six guns, gas guns, they'll shoot a half inch is, is you know, fairly common if you spend a couple of dollars. It's crazy. And uh, even, you know, like the $300 barrels for the most part now will shoot like minute of angle, which was like the the holy grail out of a bolt action M forty A three or A five uh, back in the day. So one of the things that I've, I've seen, the, especially the civilian guys, don't get for the most part is the fact that gas guns have transitioned that far. They will hang with accuracy with almost anything, and it's so much faster. But uh, we we mostly as like soft snipers, we saw this transition, but it was crazy. The last time I taught military guys, and this was specific on the Okinawa dudes, went to the urban sniper course in, Japan, in Okinawa, and they just would not let go of those goddamn bolt actions. 
because they, I don't know, they loved him so much. It was, it was, it was very kind of like frustrating to see a lot of the, uh, the Afghan and OIF experience just not translate to that. Like, look, man, I know the trigger is a little bit better, but there's no way you can run that bull fast enough for what you need to do in, you know, Fallujah or Mahdi, Sadr City, any of those places. Well, I remember 15, maybe almost 20 years ago, uh, on my on my department, we had a couple officers that were part of a regional team, and one of them uh, wound up ter- uh, being one of the snipers for the SWAT team. And I might have convinced him, you know what, check out a LaRue OBR. And he got it, and he wound up, he was neck and neck, if not beyond, all the guys with the 700s. And the guys with the 700s just could not believe how that rifle shot. And it was a cool eye-opening experience. And then I, and I, he got, he let me shoot it a couple of times and yeah, that was really cool. And this, this was a while ago. And nowadays, yeah, we, we can do that with pretty much, <laughs> it feels like almost any rifle nowadays, but back then, yeah, that was a cool, cool experience to, to see that and see, see the transition in real time, seeing people going, tell me more about the semi-auto. This is amazing. Alex. Well, so I think the, you almost bring up a great sort of, you know, crossroad, if you will. So you're talking about the Luru OBR, you know, 762 gun, whatever. We were talking about SR25, 762 guns, you know, versus, you know, an SPR, which is a, you know, Acura's yeah. match grade carbine, 556 five, gun, whatever. Yeah. And I think there's there's an important distinction there in terms of um, capability, both in terms of area of responsibility, but then also capability in terms of um, shootability, right? And that but that's that matters just as much up close as it does out of distance, right? And so you know the going to SR twenty five OBR, you know whatever AR ten or or SR compatible platform you're talking about. You are going to have a penalty in size and weight. You're going to have a penalty in uh, recoil, carrier flight. Just, I mean, it, it is the nature of the beast, right? Whereas the small frame, I'm kind of one of the reasons why I think it's so popular for the urban stuff, specifically like Clay was talking about. So, like, yeah, you know, I was an urban sniper grad. I, I was fortunate enough to go to like the pilot six week urban sniper course that got funded like fucking crazy. Um, you know, I was living my best life, dude. It was this six days a week, 18 hours a day for six weeks. And it was to this day, like we would sleep on the range. So we didn't have to draw guns. Cause we just didn't want it to end. Right. It was the best time ever. And, um, you know, when you look at what those guns can do, and I remember, and I'll, 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 you know, I'll, I'll tell you a story. It's not flattering for me in any way, shape or form, but there was a, a, a range on Stan Bay called Dodge city. And part of the urban uh, sniper courses, we would do a ruck run, uh, which is full kit, full ruck, M40 T bone on your ruck, plus M4, plus pistol, plus gun belt, all that stuff. So line one, two, and three, plus everything. You would ruck run to Dodge City, and then you would run an assault course. And it was fucking great fun. But I remember I was climbing up a ladder, and I was about two and a half stories up on this ladder and full kit with the 40 with everything. And I'm smoked, right? I'm a couple miles into this thing. And all I was remembering was, I'm going to fall off this fucking ladder. Like I am, I have so much weight on me. I have so much stuff to do. Like I'm supposed to be urban. I'm supposed to be in and out, jump through windows. I got this damn 48 inch gun T-bone on my rug. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was, it, that was one of those times where I was all of a sudden like, this is like a 200 yard range. I don't need all of this. But if I have a gun that's light enough and fast enough for presentations at an extremist distance, right? CQB distance. So from, you know, three to seven yards that I can present and, and handle like a carbine, but then I can immediately present out, you know, holding sub two MOA accuracy, which was doctrinal. And I know most of our guns can hold better than that, but doctrinal level of accuracy was two MOA. And I can hold that to 600 meters time. Now there wasn't a lot that I couldn't do. And there also wasn't a lot that I couldn't read my sites because it's not like, Hey, I build a somewhat hasty alternate position that probably doesn't have the best durability ever in terms of recoil, but I break crosshairs. It was good enough. I come right back on target and whether I had impact or splash, I can either a deliver another hit most Ricky tick. Cause it was a mobility kill that I got, or I winged him or whatever, or if it was a miss because it was a mover or stacking mover plus wind plus unknown distance, I could 
I could immediately see my splash, pick it up and hit him again because my position wasn't falling apart. The gun wasn't jumping so far off target, you know, magnification with the field of view that we had and stuff like that. And again, issued weapon systems are going to be different than what you can piece together on your own, even in the LE world, because there's a lot more latitude there. Um, but this is why, in my opinion, the small frame, like the SPR, not the DMR, not the SR25, not the AR10, not the whatever, but the true 556 five, small frame special purpose rifle why it excels in that urban environment is size, weight, speed of presentation, speed of hits, speed of follow-up shots. It can't be matched by anything else we have in inventory as, as one gun. Alex, I mean, I absolutely agree with that in, in almost every respect. And I say that coming from the position of, you know, I was a 7.62 guy. In fact, I got one of the early uh, DMRs from the Marine Corps back in like 2002. It was still built on the M14, so still 7.62 guy. But, you know, first person I shot was 7.62, fell over like a fist of God, hit him like, I am team 7.62 guy. And that, it stayed that way most of my time by, as a combat guy. For whatever reason, the team that I went to in SF, they were a 7.62 team too. Well, it turns out that the team next to us, which is the other half of Sniper Troop, was a big time uh, SPR team. You know, we had them. We had them. We had all the stuff there. And uh, so, you know, we go out and like the end of that tour, we didn't see them much. We didn't, we weren't working the same area. So we get back together and we're having like, you know, like a real, like honest debrief, like, hey, you know, this is the shit that we learned. What'd you learn? And uh, that was the first time it struck me that at these ranges inside of like 650, 700 ish, they had just as many one shot kills as we did. All right. And there was no, I mean, this isn't like a dick measuring contest. There was no reason for them to bullshit us about that, but that, you know, longer barrel length, more velocity, they were doing just the same work that we were only we're carrying a gun that's way heavier. And in fact, the, the, the SR 25 in particular, the early ones, which are 20 inch barrels, I believe was the, uh, the gen ones. Yeah. were so big and so heavy that yes. Yeah, can you do CQB with that? Yeah, you could, but it sucks. So on my team, we were carrying, you know, a shorty with a suppressor on it and the SR-25 on our back. So that turns out to be like an extra 25 pounds when you really get down to it. You know, climbing, building, all this crazy, crazy shit. Uh, so, at you know, like at that deep review, that was the first time I was really like, you know what, man, maybe the bigger bullet is not always the one. And uh, then just a couple of years later, I ended up hanging out with the uh, guy that did most of the, the vehicle testing, our VI uh, actual shooting cars, VI stuff for SOCOM. And he's like, yeah, which gun? I'm still a 762 guy. I'm like, 762, shoot the engine block. And he's like, hold on there, Sped. We tested this. Because <laughs> they had got this, uh, they were over in Djibouti, and they had, there's a dry lake bed in Djibouti that uh, we used to jump into and stuff. But they'd gotten all these cars, because they had like a, like, you know, Donald or Donald Rumsfeld money to, to do this test. They rig them all up with zip ties or whatever and start zipping them across the lake. And they're in the helicopter shooting with all the guns out of the inventory. And it turned out that the best gun was the SPR, not because you're trying to crack the engine block, because on any modern car, you just throw a bunch of bullets at it and take out the electronics, kills it a lot faster. But that was another point for the uh, for the SPR. And then kind of staying in my like uh, my friend group of you know snipers of various experience, it's about 50-50, guys that had the choice, whether they carried the SPR or the SR-25. And as we've gotten older, especially now, like there's so much value in that small frame gun for all the, I mean, all the reasons you said. Lighter, I can carry more ammo. If I have to, I can take ammo off that guy. I don't have some specialized nonsense. There's, there's, the gun's got a lot going for it. <laughs> Come on, Alex. I just want to say I, I'm so happy. I'm going to jinx myself, but no one seems to have brought up that uh, that scar abomination of uh, of a. Uh, I saw some of the testing for that abortion. No, no, oh. no. stick to waffles, sir. That's yeah. it. <laughs> <It's>, uh... <laughs> yeah, that whole system was one of the reasons I left. The gun business so <laughs> i can't blame you it was uh heavier <laughs> heavier had worse malfunctions uh was had worse actors than the sr25 or the m110 which is a bold statement uh you yeah. know, <laughs> those m110s were not exactly night's best day if we're being totally honest with everyone 
Uh, yeah, the scar <laughs> that was so bad. So it, it, it seemed, you know, what's funny about the uh, the scars too is they seemed like they were worse in five five six. There were some. I, had, I ended up teaching a couple of courses for guys going to a certain area where they had to take scar lights because it was one of those things where we left all of our stuff with the host nation and they wanted scar lights. But uh, so teaching that that course, some of the malfunctions that would happen with the uh, the light version, the five five six version. I mean, you needed like tools to clear the malfunction. It was like some weird bolt override with that uh, Volkswagen bus gear shift they have for a trigger, just all mangle faced in there. <laughs> and I was like, man, I hope you I hope you boys will go with your pistol because uh, this thing is not is not awesome. <laughs> uh, the uh, one of the the greatest things I ever saw was uh, a uh, one of those systems that came back from uh, uh, is an NSW sniper, and uh, it had a uh, it had like a uh, oh uh, the, the feedback was on the side of the gun seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> <But> <laughs> Oh, yeah. I, I talked to a couple of the people over at FN about some some of their scar variants that just didn't seem to make sense to me. But I was reassured. Oh no, this is a good idea. Okay, man. It, not to completely uh, <laughs> shit talk FN, but uh, I did ask one time. I, I finally got to talk like a VP of whatever. I'm like, dude, why the reciprocating charging handle? And a lot of the bad ideas in the SCAR program were actually the Army's fault. All right, we'll, we'll own that one. Hmm. Uh, like, they demanded the reciprocating charging yeah. handle, actually. Yeah. They are like, you will put this on there. And just, they had the capability to not make that, yeah. but they are like, okay, whatever. Customers yeah, they, wrong. they hadn't made it with the foul for, like, 50 fucking years. <laughs> <laughs> Probably could have transferred those blueprints <laughs> over. Like, yeah, maybe. Oh, Eric can't read that. And you're muted. Technology. That says NGSW, by the way, because uh, that's a, uh, yeah, I'm not going to get into that right now, but I'm sure uh, Alex probably has thoughts due to proximity. But uh, yeah. Uh, I, can, I can tell you exactly what day the Army and the Marine Corps stopped being my problem. So that one's on you. <laughs> Too easy, bro. <laughs> <laughs> So what were some of the differences in the variants of the SPRs and why? So, I, I mean, the only yeah. SPR that is like true SPR that has been yeah. in like a program of record and inventory, you know, it was going to be the Mark 12 program. Right. Okay. And it was odd, you know, outside of the, the recce rifles of the nineties, um, and into the early GWAT, and then you had Mark 12, Mod O, Mod 1, Mod H, and then the Marine Corps has uh, an SPR pretty much in name only with the uh, M38 IAR. It's an, it's an M27 IAR with a, with an old Mark 12 optic on it that's not nearly as capable as the new VCOG they put on everybody rifle. So I, I don't really know what they're doing, but um, but if you break it down really with the differences uh, between Mod O and Mod 1, and it really depended on where you were at, where it got issued. Was one was going to be optic, two was going to be rail, and then the difference mainly between the uh, mod mod O and mod one and the mod H was the barrel. And so the mod H uh, was a sixteen inch. It was it was basically if I if memory serves, it was fifth group sniper locker that was able to get it done, and it was a Noveski sixteen inch barrel yeah. running length gas. Um, with everything else basically being same, same, but running out of carbine buffer system, uh, again, realizing that, Hey, we still want this to, we want this to be a Salter plus not sniper light. Yeah. And I, that's the big thing with the SR, you know, is, you know, a 20 inch SR 25 with a fixed stock very quickly becomes a belly gun. And that's not what we're after when it comes to this from an employment perspective. And uh, so really the mod age, and to me, like, that's what I said when I came back from my first appointment with the Mark 12 mod one. And then I was like, I built my first kind of SPR, you know, I, I, I built it and I was feeling very proud of myself. And then I was realized I had just built a updated version of a mod age, you know, a couple of years later. And, and I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, 
it, you know, it's what, like one time um, I can talk about a training thing too, where I was like, oh, I figured out something smart. And then I realized that JJ Rikaza had figured it out like fucking a decade and a half beforehand. So like, again, you're like, oh, man, you know, I think that the reality is for most guys that are switched on in this field that give a fuck enough and have personal buy-in, we're all usually going to end up um, with within an, an eight, an eight digit grid of each other. Like it just the way it's going to play out, right? If you care enough and and you have legitimate experience and legitimate knowledge, we're not going to be that far off. And, and that yeah. was the reality, I think, of when I saw that and came to it. And so that was the biggest difference between Mod O, Mod 1, and, and Mod H was going to be handguard, barrel length, optic choice based on service. Um, you know, night forces were a lot more prevalent in NSW, like the two and a half to tens back in the day. Uh, the three to eight loophole mark fucking whatever the fuck um, that was, you know, Marine Corps issued. Um, I think that was big army issued for the army units that got Mark 12s, but really, you know, the SF guys could kind of put whatever they had in inventory on and do whatever they wanted. So it was a little bit different over there. Um, and really for the most part, everything else remained the same. Use the same can op sync model five, now AEM and five and now Otter Creek or whoever owns the, the stuff now the two stage trigger full auto lower um so it can kind of be like a support by fire i guess if that was the the intent for it we used a lot for breakout drills and stuff but really that was it um, um you unless you guys have a, a different memory i mean one of the things i think is still the coolest about the uh the spr platform and i don't remember if this, if this stayed for all the variants or not but the fact they went ahead and put actually usable and gangster and cool looking iron sights on the fucking thing so that your scope breaks on your sniper rifle, you're not out there with your wiener in your hand. I, that's one of the most distinctive features, I think, of the SPR. When you look at it, those, whatever the hell, those weird iron sights, because it, it's it's actually the front gas block too, right? Yeah, they're, they're cool as hell. Well, and that, that was that was on the, yeah, the, the early ones and uh it was a PRI flip up front yeah. and then went the uh, the knights flip up front and rear for the mod one. I, I don't know that the PRI is actually the most useful one, but it is the coolest looking one. It is the one that says to me like SPR. When I see that, I'm like, oh yeah, here we go. This is the OG. Well, that's what matters, how it looks. Right. And I, I just do this yeah. in checks and I don't want to forget it. Uh you guys ever noticed the uh, the back cover of Black Eyes and Green Rifles was Kyle Lamb carrying, and it, the picture that he chose for probably the most prevalent rifle book of the modern era is carrying an SPR. Black Guys and what? I, I don't that's remember a, that. That's book. a different movie. Uh, don't <laughs> don't look at my name associated with that one. <laughs> Had to get to uh, college somehow. Black Eyes. Oh, oh. <laughs> yes eric no i was just i mean uh basically around 2009 it was uh magpul uh, art of the tactical carbine yeah part of the precision carbine or precision rifle i should say and then uh yeah it was like if you didn't have a every range there was always some cool kid and i was that asshole once with a copy of black eyes and gr or yeah green eyes and black rifles yeah black eyes and green rifles yeah Whichever one, yeah. One of them was yeah, the knockoff from Chat GPT. The other one was uh, Kyle Lamb's book. But whichever one, they're both good. <laughs> w was that my range, Eric? Uh, no, uh, I was still very much an EOTech fanboy when you did, uh, I call it. So a uh, little history here for the rest of you. I was doing a train up to support third group back in 2011. And we did what's called, a, I call it Diet Coke Cephalic. It was all the flat range shit, none of the sexy shoot off stuff. Uh, and that's a uh, special forces advanced urban combat. And uh, Clay was my instructor many, many moons ago. And yeah, I was the EOTech fanboy. I was like, man, you could just flip that magnifier. And I think it was a three X at that time play that they had. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just like, man, this is great. And now I'm running an attacker with the DMX reticle. And I'm like, man, I can actually see where the hell I'm missing. And I have a dot to, change to my new aiming point uh yeah. technology I a, thing i have an eight power that's as good as old 15 powers like yeah it's amazing right how much that changes looks like the future the future is now old man that's uh, the future is now old, man. 
Oh, well, dude, before, <laughs> before we close this out, we all got to talk about our favorite SPR, I think. I mean, our modern, like our, our, our thing that we built, I guarantee you, you know, everybody we know has at least one super accurate, their cool SPR version of their, uh, of the 5.56 gun. Uh, it's a staple at this point. Why would you not? Well, I, actually, I think that would be a good transition to discuss right now, because my next question would be, okay, we've we've talked about historically what they've been. Now, what are you guys seeing on the competition world? Or where have you, how have you seen advances? And where are these advances at? So Clay already has it in hand. And he's muted. I happen to be in my office right now. Let me make sure. Oh, well, how about the seal button? Man, I this is this is my latest one that I built. Uh, I'm super happy with it. Credit Precision did the barrel for me. It's a I think it's a one and eight Bart line. Uh, I went with a cross machine and tool for the upper lower handguard running the Arca rail because I'm trying not to be a uh, a Picatinny dinosaur anymore. I still not I'm still not totally sold on the Arca rail stuff, but I'm getting there. Uh, Night Force one to eight attacker to me that right now. There, there's no optic on the market that does everything that that one does. Uh, CQB out to you know thousand yard range for you know caliber dependent. I, I just think it's really hard to uh, to beat. And of course, uh, I still like to pretend that I'm strong sometimes. So I've got the uh, Magpul PRS, you know, full boys and a light one. Cool. And you do compete with that? No, uh, I've I've been out of the competition circuit for. I don't know how how old are my youngest kid now? Eight years. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have small kids now, but uh, I I still teach with that one occasionally. Yeah, cool. Alex, well, I'm a little bit biased. <laughs> um, it's a scar. <laughs> it's it's actually an M39 EBR clone yeah. in uh, 260 Remington. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, USO on top of it. Uh, no, I. I, again, I think most guys, if you look at their rifles, we're going to end up about the same roundabout. Now, there's a couple things that I look at. So I really, really, really like a 16-inch barrel on an SPR. Uh, and I really like that because it's the um, you know, 18 plus a can starts to get a little unwieldy for legitimate like close range shooting. If you're going to run a short range marksmanship package, like if you say zero to 600 and I've said this on, I don't even know how many modcasts at this point, it doesn't mean you zero at hundred and you shoot hundred to 600. I mean, zero to 600. You have to be able to run that thing like a, like any other entry gun or assaulter gun inside the house. And then immediately, and I mean, immediately transition to long range precision shots, whether that's eliminating squirters, eliminating uh, guys coming to your target, whatever the case may be. Because again, as as a you know, usually in the role that you're rolling, you know, you're running the round with these, is you have to support the assault force, you know, to through and off the objective, right? So, um, sixteen inch suppressed is where I'm at. I like a the longest gas system I get away with on a 16 with full reliability and no adjustability. I'm looking at an intermediate length gas system again to smooth out that recoil impulse. I like to pair that with an A5 buffer system to reduce my cyclic rate and slow down that recoil impulse. Again, I'm trying to make the gun stay on target mechanically as long as possible so I can see what I need to see, make my decision while I'm resetting my trigger and press my next shot. Getting to seeing what I need to see, it's going to be optic selection. You know, that one to eight attacker, I've got one of those. It's great. It runs around on my GP gun. Um, and I actually, if, if uh, you know, Clay's rifle looks very much like my general purpose rifle, right? So it's a little uh, piece of arc up front. So if I have the time and opportunity or I'm stuck in a static or security position, I'll pull that bipod out of my kit, throw it on the quick detach and then go. But if I'm rolling around, I'm not carrying a, a, a bipod on it, right? On my SPR, that bipod's mounted. I like to run a full length Arca um, simply because if you actually spend time throwing it on props, barricades, bags, et cetera, what you find is that that full, that Arca all up and down the bag, it reduces your lateral wobble. So what you see is a, a reduce because it's a flat on flat. You don't have as much, you're not teetering because now you've got a 1.5 inch ish wide base that you're sitting on versus that half inch wide of the M-lock. It will sit much more stable pre-shot and post-shot during recoil. Um, optics wise, again, seeing what you need to see, 
So I like to run, and I've said this a million times, uh, 2X per 100 yards is kind of my rule of thumb, right? And it can be, you know, 1.5 and it can be higher. But back in the day, like when Clay and I came up, it was 1X per 100 yards was what everybody wanted. But that was golf course ranges, KD, high contrast targets, known targets, perfect light conditions, north facing ranges, all that bullshit, right? Um, when it comes to like real world, um, I like that extra magnification to be able to prosecute targets in changing light conditions, deep in shadows, beyond glass or, or beyond doorways, um, low contrast targets. So like I joke around, like we go out and we do this in, in some of our courses, we go out, we paint our targets camouflage. Like we just take camo paint, paint them up and just say, okay, find your targets. And all of a sudden it becomes a, a nut roll for guys that don't have, you know, legitimate magnification in their scopes. Um, the other thing too, that DMX reticle is, is great and a substantial improvement over the, the gen one, one to eight attacker, but a lot of LPVO reticles are too thick or too fat at magnification for reduced size targets at distance. Right. So the gun might be capable of it. The ammo might be capable of it and you might be capable of it as a shooter, but you can't prosecute that target because you're, you don't know exactly where you're holding when you're putting it on that target. So I like a little bit increased, uh, magnification when it comes to the, that, magnified or you know primary optic the flip side and, and what clay said earlier about having iron sights you know as like a, hey no matter what you got a fuck you set of iron sights on here that's where i look at now you know 2024 we have offset red dots and a lot of guys will talk about uh, uh daylight bright reticles on their lpvos on their guns and and everyone says you know they nod in agreement like yes daylight bright and I'm the only asshole in the back of the room being like, for how long? How many 2032s do you have with you? Because unless you have a belt fed 2032 feeding that thing, you know, there's a lot of those optics that if you leave them on high, you go take a piss and come back, they're dead. And so is that realistic for operational status or not? Or is that just purely range day ranges and stuff? Um, so I like to have a offset RDS. I prefer 45 degree or 35 degree, something off the side, simply because I'll run like old school mid south natural body cant with my uh, butt stock and be able to prosecute with that. Uh, I don't run over the top because a lot of my other rifles have weapon mounted laser range finders, and so it's not behaviorally compliant for me to go to the top when I'm not used to going there and won't go there on other things. Um, for as far as offset red dots go, I like closed emitters because we're not talking slide ride G force here. So if it's in a clear precipitation, sleet, snow, mud, rain, whatever, um, it, it doesn't have the G force to clear it like it would on a, on a pistol. So I like closed emitter for that. And zero is hyper important for me on that offset red dot because I want to be able to point click to 300 meters, the area of responsibility for the rifleman according to the U.S. Army. And that is kind of my once around because like and again. I want to be a salter plus, not sniper light when it comes to the SPR. So before we go to the next two guys to talk about their favorites, let's actually, no, let's do that. Let's circle back though to uh, a salter plus after Eric and, and Fred talk about their, their rifles, because that's a, that's an aspect that's I, I think ignored by a lot of people and it's having messed around over at Darcy with longer rifles to see, okay, how does this work? Eh, it's not that bad. And then, okay, 16 inch rifle. Well, eh, that's not bad. And then, okay, 16 in a can. Eh, I'm okay. Eric, your rifle. Uh, so I had a gentleman down in Alabama build this for me. Uh, basically just copying the, the recce style upper 15.1 inch barrel OCM five uh, things that were different, obviously like, I was a, uh, I had the cloner boner thing going for a while, but I kind of got away from that with this. So embarrassing. A bi normally a bipod, but I've been shooting <laughs> a lot of tack, single gun tack rifle lately. And I, I, I drive this big bitch. Like it's a fucking Mark 18, uh, lots of a zones, very slow. Uh, that's my fault. Uh, a tacker. Uh, I had an NX eight on here. I didn't mind the I box. That's the biggest complaint as I'm sure Alex will test you. But uh, I gave the NX-8 to the wife, went with the A-Tacker with the DMX. And then it's just a lot of ergonomic stuff. Um, LMT Mars, ambidextrous lower, HRF concepts, uh, the, uh, the Magwell, the combat Magwell. So it's just like, I mean, literally just sucks the mag in. It's, a, it's criminal. Um, 
but that's about it. I just wanted this, this build stemmed from my 2020 deployment to Syria. So as an EOD guy, we, uh, we ran across a lot of like surface UXO, uh, the little ball sub munitions that I'm sure Clay and Alex have like heard of at some point. Um, there was a, you know, we're clearing area and I found like three of them and you can use uh five, five, six for, uh, and this is all four services. All their EOD can do this. It's called smud standoff munitions disruption. And, um, I was like, I was sitting there, I was like, I can, I can smack a sub munition five, five, six. And, um, we were running low on C4 at the time. It was kind of like a, you had a drug deal to get your explosives. And I was like, I have a thousand rounds of extra five, five, six. Uh, so let's just shoot it. And I said to myself, if I have to deploy again, what do I want? And I was like, well, I want it to be quiet. I want the ability to see farther. Cause right at that point we had the, the razor one to six with the, uh, JM one reticle, uh, the first Sergeant who got him, uh, he's probably listening to this. He was a, he's a PRS guy and he, he got a gamer scope, which worked at the time. But I wanted, a, I would have preferred like the Christmas tree S style that the DMX provides through night course. And, and then, um, that was really just a heavier rifle. Yeah. I'll carry it, but it'll soak up recoil a little better. At least in my mind, it, it feels different. Um, but yeah, this rifle was built as if I ever have to deploy again, this is what I'll take with me. If, if I was came for a day. So cool. And yeah, you know, if you have more about, uh, using that for that for the uh, eod role i i think that would be a good thing to discuss fred yeah well i don't uh this is a uh <laughs> this is a historical piece very much but uh you know and this is uh dated cuz you know 18 inch barrel and uh but and then do they even make these stocks anymore uh no but that's yeah, the Magpul. That's, yeah yeah that's yeah i mean you know for me really this is my spr these days <laughs> but in reality and it still shoots it still functions it still works yeah when I don't want to carry my sharps, I'll carry the uh, the Marlin. <laughs> cool. So let's circle back to Assaulter Plus. I like it. Uh, yeah. This for for us in the uh, the, the SIS where they disbanded those. That was that, that was the sniper role, especially during the war. We weren't actually doing the dumb shit that we're supposed to do we were doing assault stuff and then go to the roof while the uh actual assault monkeys like rip the couch bar with a k-bar and interrogate people whatever bullshit they're doing uh so we had to be capable of both and like i said you know at, you know 27 29 with you know full-time job of going to the fucking gym it's not that big of a deal to carry two guns except when it is because it's dumb uh and as, as I've gotten, you know, how much more one could have been lighter, uh, two could have carried more, you know, fun shit. Uh, now, especially as a dude in my 40s, like I wouldn't be caught dead carrying two guns. Like there is no, no way. Uh, so, I mean, I really think that the small frame is coming back into their their own. And 5.56 five, is still fantastic. It's still what I recommend to people to get. But, man, if we want to talk about 224 Valkyrie, six millimeter arc, some of the other like gangster shit that'll fit in a small frame. That's game changing. Uh, I think I, I, this is actually, I, actually, I know this is true because Federal gave me the first ammo for it. I had the first uh, in the nation one mile hits with 224 Valkyrie uh, that there were. And six millimeter arc will pretty much dust 224 Valkyrie. Both of those rounds, I mean, just absolutely phenomenal for, the, for this size of gun. How are they burning through barrels, though? I honestly don't know because I didn't pick the I didn't shoot much two twenty four oh. valve after that. Uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's that's based off a six point eight uh, SPC cartridge, so it's going to have some, some it's going to have some cut down life. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Six millimeter arc is so new that I I don't know. I don't know if anybody shot one out yet. So I'll say it's usually not the like especially with six arc. It's really not the barrel life that's the issue. It's bolt life. Mm. Um, that's kind of the number one thing that dudes are trying to figure out right now. Um. You know, some some guys are recommending 
full bolt changes as early as 2,500 and 3,000 rounds. That's coming in their their manual for their rifle. Uh, they've it's just not a terrible trade off. It's for, it's for the caliber. That's not a terrible. Really not. It, honestly, if if you look at what it's capable of, right? Yeah. It's really not. It's just from a manufacturer's perspective. You got to deal with a ton of armies, a ton of questions about this, that, the other, because there is no free lunch, right? Kind of, I will say that the nice part about the 556, and again, there's no free lunch. Is it a thousand yard weapon system? Not really. I know a lot of guys will push it to that, and you can do it, but it's not can with like a over 90% first round hit probability, right? Like it 100%. And it's it's definitely not once you start to stack like real world shit going on. Like if you don't have the weather for stuff, if you don't have the weather, if you don't like whatever. There's if you're on a golf course range, like I joke, dude, there's guys with one to sixes and sixty two grain that can go to a thousand yards and 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 get hits and be like, oh no, it's fully capable. It isn't really. It you just you can, you know, yeah. This driver is on a close course, right? Just, just losing uh, the splash of the round past like like six hundred. When we're talking like real world shit, where I'm trying to shoot somebody and I'm looking for what I, where the fuck I missed, <laughs> it's so hard to see that splash at that range, even with good optics most of the time. Man, I, I, I'm with that, you that. That's one of the reasons why I push heavy for caliber. So even in five five six, I want to see like seventy seven grain, you know, seventy five, seventy seven, and above, simply because I want that extra splash. It's like shooting king at two mile. Like I don't want to shoot something light. I want to shoot something as heavy as possible because if I miss, I want to disturb earth, and I want to do it in a way where if I miss and I see nothing, I can look left or right, find something to splash it off of, copy paste, and get my hit right. Um, like I, I, I tell everybody in every class that we teach, I don't advocate missing. Yeah. just a fucking realist right and i want to be able to make a good educated decision as fast as possible to get my hit whether that's first round second or third round but if i have the opportunity to tag a target i don't want to let that target get away and if i've got a if i've got to splash one and learn from it i 100 percent will and, and again getting back to the small frame side of things that's what this platform lends itself to in a way. Like if you're like, Hey, Al, you have to shoot an unknown distance target zero to 500 meters. He's going to be darting out across a linear danger area and your exposure time is sub three seconds. What do you want? 100% small frame SPR. I'm on a five, five, six gun that I can fucking exploit max point blank rapid engagement zones and the light recoil to, to prosecute, you know, there's a video like last weekend I was in Ohio teaching, like I've got three rounds in the air in 0.6 seconds, right? On and, and like getting hits. It's not hard when you build a good position and you run the gun the right way. If you do like there are 0.18 splits. So I'm shooting, you know, jailbait splits, but instead of at three to seven yards, I'm shooting them at four seventy or whatever that target was out there. It's totally capable of doing it. The system is the shooter can be. If you obviously do that with my SR25, the sheer recovery shot to shot is going to preclude me from keeping on that target. Yeah. So when I look at what this thing is meant for, and yeah, you know, Kyle the four, you know, I talked to, to I talked to the four a bunch, and 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 again, he's a great. I like I said, I wish he was on this podcast because he's got a ton of like real world knowledge from when the command brought that like brought what we know as the SPR to life pre-Mark 12. Um, but he he broke down, he said fours, right? So zero to 400, five, five, six, four to eight, three, eight or six, five, 800 and beyond, you know, three, three something, right? 338, three wind mag, whatever. And a lot of guys, but I can go further and, you know, yes, you can. But for us that are doing it for real, it's like, I don't want to fight on hard mode. I want to get my hit and move on, you know? And like, it, it, when he broke that down for me, I was like, yeah, dude, I like, I can 100% zero to six doctrinal distance to the SPR inside of four. It's really hard to fucking miss, especially a 12 inch. And I base everything off a 12 inch target because it's top ahead to super sternal notch. And so usually if somebody outside of like the Durga Durga Muhammad Jihad over the top, um, they have to present, you know, head shoulders, at least part of it and their hands to me, uh, for pistol rifle, shotgun, machine gun, whatever. Um, so like I, I inside of four, like dude, you can't, which is threat weapon distance, but like you can't match my speed and precision, you know, and that's just 
if if that's all they got and I know what I have, it's a wrap before it starts, even if I'm behind the eight ball. Very good. And so how about applying those concepts to indoors or short range urban scenarios? You're talking about using this goes back to I, I feel like the 16 inch. It, it's kind of funny. The ATF stuck us. The 16 inch is the shortest one that we can have easily. Yeah, because it's almost the perfect barrel. length. It does everything so well. Now, I, I'm i actually like in process of building a 20 right now just because you know I want to max my speed again, whatever. But when it really gets down to like the brass tacks, like I'm I can only have one gun because we're going to do some real boy stuff. It's going to be a 16 uh, hands down. And I being also ha having been on the uh, the teaching CQB side, uh, I know that that works really well. Like you can teach a guy to run a, a suppressed 16 in a house. No big deal. You start going to an, an 18 or a 20 suppressed. Now, I mean, we're getting to a point where things are a little bit uh, silly. Uh, it can be done with, you know, proper technique and all that, but you go back to the 16, it's just, it's just as easy as any other gun. All right. You don't have to have a 10. You can run a 16 as fast. You can run a 10 inch, like hands down uh, without, without question. I actually have a question for the, uh, the panel. Like who's making the best collapsible precision stock. Now I've tried the B five systems and I was not a huge fan. I didn't hate it either, but uh, I'm so stuck on the damn heavy Magpul PRS stock <laughs> that uh, is just so great, but it's not great for, for CQB for, for being the installer plus, if you will. So I, I look at a couple things. So I didn't, I like to run a collapsible rear um, one because I like to fit it to me, especially on the CQB side, but also usually if you set yourself up right for proper eye relief, when you come up, from prone you're usually going to have to come in a certain amount of distance to get that length of pulse so your eye relief isn't fucked up if you're going to stay square to the gun target line right so i really like a fast adjust uh carbine-esque stock i do also and like there's a video out on youtube where i go through like gun breakdown you know, somebody captioned in class but like i like a, a butt stock that has a protected lever because if you utilize a rear bag and sometimes more often than not, like this happened twice this past weekend, if you grip the stock correctly to manage recoil during the shot process, you, you can very often disengage or engage rather that lever. And now that buttstock is waiting to, to slide and you can become a pirate really, really fast. Right. So I, I usually run a Magpul CTR buttstock that's protected and with some additional add-ons, whether it's the LaRue Mub, I use that forever. Not that I wanted the, um, monopod in the rear at all. I just wanted the extra surface area to ride the bag and be a bit of a thumb grip. The Arasaka kits, the same thing. Ike from big tech slash Kratos, they just dropped their, uh, kind of, um, thumb hook bag rider deal. So any of those I like because it's still a carbine It's collapsible. I can make those adjustments going from prone to whatever else. Uh, but I want that ability to ride the bag. And most importantly, I want that lever protected. Uh, so I don't make myself a fucking pirate. Arr. No, that's good stuff. It was funny. Uh, actually, a lot of dudes that ran SPRs back in the day that instead of the SR, we ran fixed stocks on our SR25s so again. We had the shorty guns, but most of the other guys ran collapsible stocks on theirs. Uh, yeah, I, it, it goes back to that, you know, nothing's free. I want all of it though. I want a heavy precision fixed rear stock that also collapses somehow. Uh, nobody's, nobody's given me that just yet. Maybe we can get Dwayne on the phone and see if he can. Texting him right now. Literally, he just texted me, and I'm saying, "Hey, we're still on." <laughs> I, I do like the. Uh, I've used the Magpul light a few times too, uh, but the pain in the ass about that one is it takes tools to adjust. That's that's your trade off. So it's, you know, for a real stuff gun, it's it's really not the right answer in a lot of ways. So cut off the CTR plus all of the Arasaka attachment, it adds a decent amount of weight to the ass end of the gun. So the, with the Arasaka to be able to mount it 
It is a uh, an adapter, a butt pad, and the bag rider. So it's a three piece aluminum set oh, that goes on the back end. Snap. And Dude, it, I haven't tried that one. That, I tell you what, though, that's going to be on my list like this week. Uh, I like Aerosaka's others. I use a lot of their uh, attachment stuff. I didn't know about that, that stock kit, but I've got just like everybody else, I got like nine CTRs laid in the toolbox right here. I'm going to order that and try it this week. So check it out. And the other thing that I will tell you too is, you know, guys that run like high, um, high mounts, right? So one seven, one nine three, whatever and above. The CTR at least allows you to mount whether it's a LaRue riser or a Magpul uh, cheek riser or a Sun and Shadow cheek riser or something. So like you can maintain consistent head position behind it, especially on the LPVOs that don't have parallax adjustment. You can find yourself like you'll be printing small groups, but you'll print them you know, an MOA in either direction as you mount the gun over and over again, because you lack consistency behind the rifle. So like, that's something that's nice. The other thing that I will, and this is a, a game genie cheat code. So uh, Matt, I remember texting you uh, a while ago, you had Ken good on for a low light episode. Yeah. Right? This throwback name, right? So I learned this from him when he was teaching shotgun at the surefire Institute. So let's get in the fucking way back machine and figure this out. But the Arasaka kit comes with a limb saver butt pad. And one of the things that Ken used to teach was to take electrical tape and run it around the outside of the limb saver. So if you're to do a high ready presentation or anything like that, it would not catch any of your kit or apparel. It would slide right out. And then the back of the butt pad would still be there. So when you run the butt pads, you know, I go to murder depot, grab me a piece of electrical tape wrap that bitch real quick and you're good to go that's amazing it's funny you brought up the uh the, the uh eye position behind the uh lvpos too this is this is a crazy piece of trivia for leopold did you ever get a chance to shoot the uh what did they call it it was like the one day it was the one to eight with like 15 letters behind it but it was actually like a 1.025 to eight it was C- super expensive S-S. yeah it uh c w s s s s s w s or some bullshit like that elemental p and it cost almost as much as the night force. Well, uh, I didn't have them, but I knew some buddies down the street that got them issued, right? And uh, they were like, what the, f- what, what is with this thing? Because the red dot was only visible if you were perfectly behind the gun. So if you were off a little bit, you're trying to see QB and stuff too, you couldn't see the red dot. Uh, they called Leopold and they're like, yo, what? And like, we did that on purpose so that you have to be, you can literally only see the electro dot in the center if you're perfectly behind the gun. Yeah, otherwise it'll show up as like maroon. Um, and exactly. Yeah, that was that was in the Mark Eight CQBSS, the one point one to eight. Um, That's the one. So the Mark Six, one to six of yesteryear had the same thing. Um, but do it's people people sleep on the LPVO in terms of like gun setup, and it's it's fucking hypercritical. Yeah, it's uh, for a do everything optic. They're, I mean, they're really hard to beat. I, I come to that not only having, you know, practice in the house a little bit, but being a, a three gunner for a long time, it was, you just get amazingly fast and even close range targets for those LVPOs. And then all of a sudden you're looking around like, I know my EOTech saves like a half a pound, but it gives up so much in that even back in the day, like six power magnification, is so much different than, a, you know, a, an aim point or some nonsense like that. So Eric brought up Christmas trees. I really enjoy Christmas trees, not only during Christmas, but even on magnified optics. Have you guys been finding them just as useful or is there, have you through your training, through your experience, has there been, uh, Clay has a secret. I can tell. (laughs) I was at the, uh, I was there when the when when SF at least was in the the pissing match between you know early Todd Hodnet that stuff and mm-hmm. uh, and Horace Reticles and you know H twenty sixes and the old guys that did not want to transition to this new reticle they were they were fighting it fucking tooth and nail and uh, it almost like came to like fist fights at like the SIF conferences every year because these dudes wanted <laughs> a Leopold with the football size mill dots and that was it they just dial all the stuff on and then you know do stuff. And uh, all of us that have been to hot nets at that point, we're like, you're out of your, you're out of your mind. You are out of your mind. And uh, yeah, it was a, it was a bigger fight than I think people appreciate today. Like that was a massive undertaking to get people to transition over. Well, and then with the combination, quick follow-up shots, oh, semi-auto. Dude, the, second, the second round sniper capability of like yeah. a Christmas, you're like it's night and day. 
Alex? So I, I, most of my optics, you know, that, that can do have a tremor three. Um, but I will also, I grew up with a Gen 2 mil dot reticle. So like, I'm very used to holding in space. A lot of guys hate the Christmas tree, uh, because they call it like too busy. I'm not one of those guys, but those guys do exist. And, and I, I'm a full believer in setting your equipment up for you. Like dude, F1 drivers don't jump in a car and not have it set for them. The seats built for them. They go out and test, they dial in just like suspension for them per course, whatever. And we're, obviously we're not that, but I, I don't try to tell anybody they have to shoot like me. I want them to perform like me. I don't necessarily need them to shoot like me. Right. When I'm, when I'm teaching and, uh, I like the T threes. I like some of the you know, mill XTs or whatever. Uh, that being said, if you look at the doctrinal distance of an SPR, and if you're shooting a legitimate five, five, six load, not a two, two, three load, legitimate five, five, six load out of anything, 14, five or longer, you are going to be sub five mils to 600 meters. And if that's the case, then you're within those first five stadia lines of any reticle that you're, you're potentially looking at when it comes to where you're going to hold, you know, whether you're, if you're holding inside of five mils or you're dialing and getting your hits or whatever, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to be hundred percent on you from your, from your method of engagement. But I like them, but not everybody does. And, Honestly, that's okay. That's yeah. where, where, where I'm at. Yeah. Eric. So my first experience with the LPVO was, uh, it was the original NX8, with the FC mill. And I kind of thought, the only reason I thought it was garbage was because that, uh, and I'm sure uh, Alice can attest to this, that fucking center dot is huge. It's like the moon just sitting in there. It's ridiculous. So way, when I see DMX, what's up? It's way too big. You couldn't see anything behind it unless you were shooting men and a man. Yep. It, it was hard to get a good zero. And I'm that asshole that listened to Travis Haley because I think he's right. You're zeroing is part of the maintenance process. Check it for each range trip. And I'm always chasing like that good group. And uh, when the DMX came out, I was like, yes, this is the answer. This is like what I want. And, uh, but I think it comes with, uh, if that's the first thing you trained on, then yeah, you're probably going to be sold on it. And I, I, I hearken back to a question I had for an 18 Bravo in Syria. I was talking to, with him about like presentation with like a red dot on pistol. And he's like, a lot of the younger dudes coming out of, uh, you know, coming out of the Q course, loving that red dot because they, they came up on it. They don't know anything else. Uh, it's the first thing they're introduced to you. And then some of the old hats, they like the different sight picture. They're like, I'm already fast with irons. I don't give a shit. And so I think that that kind of can, that kind of similar principle can apply. It's like, Hey, I grew up on this old school reticle. Why that? This is too much, man. Like they've, they've already got that neurological pathway built for that minimalist approach. And it's like, uh, you know, just because you put somebody in a faster car, doesn't mean they can drive it as good as they're the one they're used to, I guess if that makes sense. And what about that EOD use? So the reason uh, we even got the LPVO and I started like considering the air quotes SPR we have at home, uh, it was uh, going to Syria and we still had an IED threat and we weren't sure what we were walking into. And the first sergeant was like, hey, we want you to be able to do a, a hasty long range recon. And so typically you're getting up until you can see disturbed earth. But with a one to six, well, you know, all right, if it's a hundred yards away, divide that by six. Like I could see it like it's X many feet away. Fuck yards is feet now. And I, I can look at it and I can assess things. Um, and then it was one of those, it's a multifunctional tool. It's a force multiplier. Um, we get over there and it's wide open spaces, it's not mountains like Afghanistan. And you're sitting on long roads with good lines of sight and it's not incredibly built up like Iraq was, which play will attest to. Uh, so you got a lot of open space and it's like, I want to be able to see something coming a ways off and I want to have the ability to engage it because at that time we were supporting my platoon, my company was supporting the SF battalion. We worked uh, with 
one ODA piecemeal here and there. And it was like, Hey, bring EOD. They got LPVOs. They're not complete retards. At the very least, they can try to take shots at, at range if it, if the need arise. Uh, luckily we didn't have to worry about that, but then, you know, we, we found it worked well for standoff munitions disruption because you're looking at about a two, three quarter to three inch diameter ball that's filled with explosives and frag. And you're like, all right, I need to engage this at a hundred meters. Well, all right, throw a sandbag down the ground, get prone. It then essentially turns into a planned demolition operation at that point. And the LPVO was really good for that. Uh, I wasn't a fan of the JM1 reticle and no disrespect to Jerry Machulik because he's fast on a gun and I don't want to cross him, but he built it for the Stadia. If I'm not mistaken, the Stadia lines on the Razor 1 to 6 with the JM1 are not like the APOG where it, it represents 19 inches, the average width of the military age male shoulders. It's meant for half of a, Ipsic, a regulation Ipsic silhouette. So, it, it was a little bit of guesswork. And once again, that kind of drove the decision for my personal rifle. I was like, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't really have a good fine frame of reference to, to do the guesswork and Kentucky windage that shit uh, onto the round. Whereas if I would have had an attacker or uh, some, uh, not that I would have a Horus, because I think for me in my use case, that's a, uh, that's gross overkill, even though I, I think they're fine reticles. I've, I've looked through a few of them on friends rifles, but, yeah, it, uh, we tried to make a SPR light, essentially. It was like, hey, we know the M4A1 barrel is it, it, tits. Uh, yeah, it's not free-floated. Yeah, we've got to crank it up to 6X because we have a front sight post in the way because the Army won't let us mod weapons in a conventional unit. Uh, but I think the, the heart of the SPR, in my layman's opinion, it, is really just having the LPVO or MPVO <laughs> and being able to get that better – better feedback really because the m4a1 is capable of good accuracy as long as you rule out all the environmentals that you can input on the gun like pressing it up against the barricade all that fundamental stuff once you rule that out you know throw that mpv or the lpv on there and get that data and be able to really understand what's happening down range so but yeah i uh we we try to get ergies uh the uh, 75th, when I was at JBLM, they were getting rid of their Mark 18s and picking up Ergies and all all links. And we're like, you know, why don't we get like a 16-inch Ergie up or the, the Geisley and and just mount mount these uh, razors on it? And there just wasn't an appetite for it in my organization. People thought, oh, you know, you're just trying to be baby S. And it's like, well, no, you're, you're supporting the customer. You should be able to have at least a... a a glimmer of a hope of possessing a capability that will help them. If that makes sense. Like, I don't want to be a useless guy on the open with my, uh, cool. I have a, a M68 site with no magnifier and guys still run that. And I'm like, that's cool, but it's, it's a certain use case, but I digress. I've been, I get long winded, Matt, you, you always do this. You spin me up. Well, you know, what was it? 10 years ago, I was at a, uh, a uh, scope carving course put on by Buck Doyle. And then I, my eyesight was better. I was running a 14.5 Hodge rifle with a red dot. And I wanted to see, okay, how far can I go out? And I think I was engaging around 700 something yards or meters or whatever the hell it was. I don't remember. And what I wound up doing, what I, I, I was able to cheat because my background were, could be my uh, points of reference. I didn't, I had my one point of reference as my aiming point. It, yeah, red dot and a Horus, that would be awesome for that case. Nothing else. Um, hell, put it on my put it on my duty pistol. Yeah, for that for those long range shots. But yeah, using my uh, my backstop or my backdrop as my okay. I need to hold over here and go a little bit this way. And okay, top of this tree is where I'm aiming. Okay, hit good. Okay, back to the tree. Fun stuff. Now, Dwayne Clay had a specific request. No, I did. Oh, no. <laughs> no. We got the guy under them. I'm impressed. Hey, okay. So we were talking about uh, SPRs and yep. uh, precision stocks that go with them. Uh, I've tried the uh, the B5 systems collapsible. Uh, I'm not a big fan. It, it's, it's got some some lacking to it. Yeah. I still like the, the original or the Gen 3, the Magpul, PRS, the heavy one. 
I, I've tried the lights too. Uh, some of my client guns run lights. I don't like those because they, well, I have to adjust them with tools. All right. So for, if I'm teaching a class, it's kind of a pain, but yep. is there anything in the works to give us most of this, but in a collapsible version? Or do you have it in the product line? I haven't even looked at it yet. And now the, the guy. Just no, it was just released yesterday. <laughs> so I, I'll tell you why. And so the the whole idea of a collapsible adjustable with the um you know cheek riser adjustment and all the other stuff. Um we were asked to make that stock previously, but um and and, and it probably won't ever be in the line just because of the reasons uh of if you really want a collapsible, you probably aren't running a, an optic high enough that you really, really need that um, cheek riser. And if you do, um, you're going to run into a situation where when it's collapsed, you're going to run the dang thing into your charging handle. And it's really difficult for it to be in the right place um, at the right time um, with an adjustable you know, or collapsible uh, uh stock with the cheek riser mounted on there that's adjustable up so our philosophy is we're but you're better off with um something like the prs light which is you know these the, the prs gen 3 is absolutely in a class setting it saves you a lot of stuff because you can easily just change stuff on the fly right but if you're you kind of set it and forget it for your own personal rifle then you can save a little bit on uh, on weight um, as well as, uh, as cash with the, uh, the PRS light. Um, so that's kind of the thought process there is like, not everybody has the need to adjust that thing all over the place all the time. Oh, it was um, actually amazing how, how cheap the uh, PRS lights are. I was shocked. I mean, that's a value. An expensive. Right <clears throat> and, 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 <laughs> yeah. No, it, and semantics, I mean, but yeah, I mean, it's it's though, marketing yeah. semantics. It's uh, that stock is also pretty much bomb proof. Um, which also becomes, an, it's another reason why it's difficult to deal with uh, collapsibles with all the adjustment mechanisms in them, is you end up with issues with the type of rifle that you put them on, generally being somewhat heavier, uh, and then passing 32045, uh, you know, drop test, five foot, negative 60, up to 180 and, you know, ambient as well on the polished concrete. So um, there's challenges there. So as the aforementioned collapsible that does that doesn't fare very well in that situation, which is one of the things we want all of, all of our stocks with the exception of a few um, that fall under the Mo moniker stuff or like, you know, 1022 backpacker or something like that um, past 32045 and it's 100% mandatory on us. So it's one of the, those, those combination of reasons is why we have not done that. But really if that, you end up with the cheek riser in the wrong place at the wrong time for everything. So it's it's either getting hit with the charging handle or it's not in the right place for your face. And then you have to, so you either have to set it up so it's right for you and then move the optics. So everything actually works for you with eye relief and staying out of the way of the charging handle and it's in the right place for your cheek. And then it's, then it's, do I hit the right hole or do I not hit the right hole? And you know, that's in the story of my life all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, what if we gave the engineers like a pallet of cocaine and like a pallet of whiskey and an unlimited budget? Then you'd get we a do, mini we, fix. We we do, we do, we do we do that. I mean, but <laughs> I mean, do you have any job openings right now? The reality is for SPR as well with stocks and stuff, right? So, like, the way I look at it is, like, if you, uh, you've got to give me a really, really good use case to not be running a 1.54 inch high mount on a precision rifle with on a, on a flat top AR um, step one, step two, even if you are that guy that, that needs a higher height of comb on a one five, four, just because of how your face is structured or whatever. Once you start to add in things like, Hey, we're running kit, we're running lids, we're running, ear pro comms like you're in positions that aren't fucking perfect because we're fighting with this rifle it's again assault or plus on sniper light all of a sudden that little bit of slop that might be a quarter to a half inch of what you need to like you know if you fall, fall asleep on the gun what you need to come up and hit all of a sudden you really like that i can give you guys a perfect example like we shot mammoth a bunch of years ago and there was a stage where you had to swap rifles with your sniper partner. Now my sniper partner is six foot five. I'm five foot eight. Like his rifle was set up different. We were both running AI chassis at the time. 
they were perfectly set up for both of us strong side. I got on his gun and we had to shoot it offhand. And all of a sudden I'm crawling over the top of the gun. My, my, my face is basically sideways to see through the optic. And it was at that point I realized that we had fucked up. And, you know, ever since then I've set stuff up to be able to go, uh, you know, bilateral, you know, with whatever position I might find myself in with kit, no matter what, I, w- I don't want to force myself out of my exit people. I want to be able to find it no matter what. And that's something that I think, you know, got like, we set precision rifles up perfect. And the SPR is a, you have to do a lot of that initial precision rifle type setup to get it ready to run. But at a certain point, you have to understand like it's a fighting gun. If it's not perfect, it's okay because you're going to find yourself in non-perfect situations. And that's absolutely uh, another factor there. So what, what people say when they want a collapsible, adjustable, as I say, what you really probably want is a UBR or something like that um, because it gives you that steady cheek weld, but you really probably don't need all the adjustment stuff. That is one of my all-time favorites. I ran that for like three seasons, three got it, and I was, uh, I was, I was, I'm a, I'm a, I remain a fan. So what are some of the things you guys are seeing now past the the traditional SPRs and how are they differing from those original SPRs? Oh man. Uh, I think again, you're like, I'm, a, I'm an SPR fan and they're, they're cool and stuff, but as far as like original spec versus what's today, yep. that's the same thing as comparing like a, a modern AR 10 to the M14. Like yes, it's, it's not even close to the same animal. Uh, I, I don't what what barrels were they using on the original SPRs? Were, were that just eighteen inch rifle gas, right? Um, but I mean, whose were they? Were they were they custom or were they like off the shelf? Um, it was a place called the Barrel Barn. I think it was down in Tennessee. Are you serious? Yeah, that's where some of the original. You bought them from the Barrel from. Barn. Yeah, it's, str- it's in the strip I mall. I think that was the new KFC's place. right there. <laughs> that's, the most US, that's the most U.S. government thing I've ever heard. But <laughs> it's right next to the check cashing place. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You're not kidding, are you? They weren't like part lines or something. They were they were from the barrel part. Yeah, I think that that's that name sticks in my head. That I mean, and it was you know. Oh and that was God. that was the business name of somebody who was, you know, they were. Oh, OK, well, that might be different then. But OK, yeah, so they, my, you know, my, my it was somebody that. My understanding is a lot of them were Douglas Barrel. OK. Um, And then you had some that were like White Oak or CLE. Oh, uh, yeah. OK, I think I remember. The Mod H's were Noveskis. Uh, OK. And that's in terms of that program record, the M38, you know, the current SPR, the only current SPR that, that is actually in inventory right now. Um, it's just an M27 with a different optic on top. So it's an HK barrel. Well, I'm going to say even, even against uh, just metallurgy has changed so much in the last 10 years, like barrel metallurgy and stuff. I, I would, I would guess that most anything we can buy today that's high end will, will dust off like a, you know, an old school SPR as far as, you know, accuracy is concerned. Uh, I mean, the stuff coming out today is just, I mean, it's ridiculous. Any good barrel maker today, you buy their stuff, it's, it's ridiculous as long as it's the least, you know, half ass put together. So what are some of the aspects, positive aspects for operational rifles now compared to what was around then? Do you guys talk about um, stretch gas with 18 inch barrels yet? No. So that's an interesting one. If you ever had an 18 inch rifle gas barrel that you just could not get to shoot for whatever reason, well, you've got this huge 95,000 gas port, right? Um, so stretch gas was the the solution there. You didn't necessarily want to run a mid gas with a barrel that long, um, but running stretch gas. So white oak stretch gas is what I run on my three gun rifle and I have an SBR that I built that, that way as well. 16 inch still, you know, mid gas, but stretch gas guys are running 16 inch stretch gas as well but the the 
the intermediate or stretch gas is a, is is very helpful and it just some 18 inch rifle, rifle gas guns shoot great and some of them shave or whatever they're attributing you know issues with that big port um so that's certainly been helpful in consistent accuracy in, in an 18 inch gun anyway <laughs> Wow, I'm gonna have to dig into that. I no, I'd never even actually heard that term before today, and uh, now now I'm excited to learn some new stuff. Very cool. So, so stretch gas refers to intermediate gas length. The difference in between like a carbine, a mid, and a rifle is that the intermediate means different things to different manufacturers, and so you will have a different or a varying length if you jump from one manufacturer to the other in a intermediate gas system. So yeah. some intermediates might be shorter than others. Really what it does, again, like we talked about earlier, the longer you can make that plus with the better buffer, you know, I, like I said, I like the Viltor A5. I want to decrease that cyclic rate and slow things down. But the longer or that more I can stretch out that recoil impulse so I can remain visually on target. It's not so much about felt or uh, perceived recoil. It's about, for me, it's about visual speed. It's, you know, this is why one of the things I love about bringing pistol shooters to the SPR platform is they already have visual speed, visual discipline. I can just teach them to go fast. It's much harder to take a precision rifle guy and make them go fast because it feels weird for them. They don't like it because they're like, ah, this doesn't. So my buddy, um, Matt knows him, but Jared Reston, right? He refers to it as kissing your sister, right? So at first it's weird, but the more you do it, the easier it gets. She's I'm not pretty- from the South. I'm sorry. Uh, he is, right? so, it's, it's, uh, it's a matter of learning what good enough looks like right? so that, that's, that's, like. that's his joke right but like it's it's the reality is when you try to take it when you try to make a precision guy go fast it's like trying to make him kiss his sister when you try to make a uh, a, a pistol shooter be accurate at distance all you got to do is a little bit of positional work and get them to understand data and wind, but they can visually and mentally process C and have the discipline of clear sight picture, good enough, no better, and send it, especially when you get to positional shooting. Because in positional shooting, it's very much like pistol shooting where everything is fucked up all of the time. And so it is, it is way easier of a leap for them than it is to go the other way. I, I see that 100% and uh, across my time too. I always used to say I could make uh, a pistol shooter, or I've seen every pistol shooter is already a good rifle shooter. A lot of rifle shooters are not good pistol shooters. It doesn't go the other way. But uh, yeah, dealing with that instability and speed and all that stuff from a, a stupid gun, as we will call them, a pistol, you can go to a rifle easy. You've seen a lot of dudes that are awesome with a precision gun. They cannot take that step down to the little gun. Yeah, our department just got new patrol rifles. Nothing SPR, nothing fancy. 12.5 uh, psionics ARs, great guns. We just went through, just adopted red dots on Glocks. Everyone's doing well. And I told everyone, okay, you thought that was easy. This is going to be even easier. And sure enough, everyone loved it. It was easy. It was fun. Nothing to it. And no, no having to kiss sisters. Well, I mean, hey, let's not rule it out. But... Uh... The Alabama National Guard shooting team would like a word. That's right. <laughs> Roll tight. Eric's going to hear about that in real life, though, like six months. You get sent down to Alabama to teach a quarter of the day. Hey, you! Come Zorn. here! Zorn. <laughs> All Eric's going to hear in the background is... Yep. <laughs> His wife Give is me running with that. Too. Yeah. Flashbacks to my Iraq deployment with 20th group. <laughs> 2033. So what are some other uh, modern updates? What do you, what do you, uh, yeah, whether it's oh, police, oh. even competition. Trigger. Yeah. Oh my God, a trigger. Yeah. Okay. A trigger. Oh That's, my God. What yeah. is, what is new? <laughs> the, the, I don't know if anything's necessarily new, but going from, I don't know what came in the SPR to start with. Was it just a standard? I don't remember. Was this standard mil spec trigger? Uh, did they ever? No, yeah, it was the that? it was the ninth <laughs> armament. Okay, to so stay a little bit of okay, which wasn't you know awful. It was, uh, but it's not great either. But uh, this is what I, I learned as soon as I stepped into like the competition. Well, I was still in the army when I I started shooting three gun, and I had AR goals, and I was like, oh my god, like where has this been my yeah. entire career? 
the thing that I tell people when they're building a, a, a rifle of any flavor is the first thing you should buy is a trigger because it's going to save you like $5,000 in training ammo. You can get good with a bad trigger, but it's going to take a lot of work. Or you can just shortcut that, spend 300 bucks, buy a good trigger, and make everything easier. Well, you said AR Gold. You know, we uh, those are actually where there was a time when Knights had a serious issue and all of our triggers were losing a stage. And so we, uh, the AR gold actually won the, uh, the competition, but there was just enough of a, uh, difference in where the pinholes are that they wouldn't drop into 100% of the military oh. lowers. And oh, that that's why, yeah, that that's why the AR Gold never made it, you know, oh, as an that issue hurts. trigger. That hurts so bad. <laughs> I have full disclosure, I, I shot on AR Gold's team, so I know Ronan Coleman very well, and that's still my trigger of choice. But, uh, and look, you know, in full disclosure, anybody's trigger now. Guys, one of the good guys, Lee, is a trigger tech, an AR Gold. You put that in a, a modern AR, and it's like a night and day difference. So that's why I tell everybody, just, Pick one and and run it, and you'll be so happy. So, uh, a couple of things that we've seen is the air goal. That's a cassette style trigger. I'm trying to remember. Yes, it is. It has a one piece drop in. Yeah, complete drop in. So the cassette style triggers seem to have reliability issues. Um, you know, AMU they run trigger techs, they run the air goals, they run all that stuff, but they they change them out quite frequently because of the reliability issues. The biggest thing that comes down to SPR is that two stage or single stage, you know, and it goes back to when we were coming up, we were taught the two different, the differences in, in trigger control, you know, doctrinally of interrupted versus uninterrupted trigger control and interrupted trigger control. We were always told was sub you know, what you wanted. You wanted to run uninterrupted, meaning you decided to prosecute the shot. You kept building, you know, uh, in modern day terms, prepping the trigger until the gun went off, you know, and that's what it was. Um, the reality of the real world and with the implementation or proliferation of two stage triggers was that by default, you were going to have some sort of interrupted trigger control, whether it was your opportunity, you know, from the target presentation or whatever, you know, in and out, in and out, in and out, or coming to that first stage, prepping on the second stage, whatever the case may be. Um, <clears throat> Really, what you have to understand is just, you know, what your trigger does. I don't really care what trigger you want to use. And again, in today's day and age, they're, all of the programs of record are basically fucking dead. So if you want to do something, whatever you want, just understand what you're getting from that trigger. Do you want to prep through a wall and come to it? Or do you want a super fast single stage trigger? I will tell you that on some of the super light single stages, like the MDs or trigger techs or whatever in a cassette style that drop into the AR, when I see those things run on precision, if guys do not manage the back end of the gun with the proper amount of like buttstock control on the rear bag or in position, the tendency to bump fire semi auto is fucking high. Um, so it's just something to be considered, uh, to consider. Uh, when you're selecting your trigger, both for trigger weight, trigger type, etc. I also remember uh, pins walking with cassettes. With cassettes, I always, yeah, that, I should caveat that. Every one I put the uh, anti-walk pins in, it's 15 bucks. It's a, it's a problem solved. Yeah. Uh, I still run my, like, precision rifle, or excuse me, like anything that's semi auto I still run about three and a half pounds, even if it's adjustable. I've tried it with some of the others down to, like, what I do on my real precision gun, which is like a pound and a half. I don't like it on a semi-auto, so I, I turn it back up to about three and a half before I keep it. I prefer a single stage, which is what the, uh, the AR Gold is or where the trigger tech could be. Uh, my theory on this is uh, I want the shot to go off right now, like right when I tell it to. And I'm not a big believer in, in prepping anything. I just want it to go right now. Uh, to the point of durability, I won't I won't speak for, for trigger tech because I don't know them, but I do know I had a, an AR Gold with – four seasons on it, like 70,000 rounds uh, through mud and all kinds of crazy shit, and it, it held together. And I will uh, actually send you one if you want to test it on, on the house. Two-stage guy. Two-stage. Oh, Dwayne. Ah, <laughs> oh. <laughs> A trail. 
Shit, I was just gonna say freeze better than cheap. So fucking send. <laughs> okay, Dwayne. So you need to think about your sister. Oh wait, no, that's something else. <laughs> <laughs> this is where somebody says I was already thinking about it. Yeah. Mm. So Dwayne, trigger. Uh, I have a number of SSAEs, a um, couple of high speeds, uh, and some Larues floating around in in rotation still. But I do like a two stage trigger. I like to uh, I like to prep through that. Uh, the bump fire thing is very real, depending on your positional stability. And bottom line for me is, you know, so, as long as the trigger weight is low enough, it's it's high enough that I can f- I feel that wall right to prep that shot as I'm settling the crosshairs into my firing solution. But it's uh, it's light enough that it provides me with the margin of error uh, to avoid disturbing positional stability um, as I break the shot or initiate the firing signal. It almost sounds like you were really reading a manual. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, it's really hard to hate that little root trigger on the uh, the Black Friday or Thanksgiving sale, whatever he does. It's really hard to hate that yeah. one at that price. Honestly, they're, they're, they're really nice, especially the price is insane. I don't know. It's just... That's a, that's probably just a mark thing. I don't know if it makes business sense, but no, it doesn't. That is just a giant fuck you to Bill. Yeah, <laughs> Fred. <laughs> anything on triggers? Uh, no, I mean you know, like say my all of my experience was with the 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 Knights Armament trigger that we had in the eleven and twelve, and then. With those issues, I went to an AR Gold, and yeah. uh, so Eric, you know my my guns practically you know from the eighteen hundreds now. So. That's right. Yes. <laughs> so that or the sharps. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I prefer a set trigger on my sharps. So. Yeah. <laughs> Eric. Oh. Uh, SSAE on mine, uh, Palmetto has a sale every now and then, and I picked up two of those and then Brownells had the three gun trigger they made with Geisley and I threw that, that's on like the, the shorty, but, um, yeah, just SSAE, nothing too crazy. Yeah. Well, I remember for the longest time that was like the standard. Yeah. Everyone got those. Like, meta, right? Like all the kids were running Geisley SSAEs and I was like, all right, cool. Yeah, let's go for it. And feel free not to answer because your wife is watching right now. <laughs> so what else? Okay, so we've covered triggers. What other? I guess we we could oh, talk man, more man. about uh, yeah stocks and and hand guards. No, not hand guards yet. Stocks and and uh, grips. Optics. Wayne. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When you think about grips. Uh, so grips, we make about 400, I think at this point, um, <laughs> you for, got all, one or two, right? <laughs> for, for all manner of thing. I'm a K2 guy at, at this point in my life. I like the way that's that kind of styre inspired hump at the back, um, positions, my hand, uh, facilitates straight to the rear trigger pull. There's no, um, kind of contact, uh, or drag with the trigger finger for me with that, especially, but it still fills my hand. So I like it quite a bit. Alex? I think that, it, you know, it's an incredibly personal choice. I, I yeah. We, we, yeah. Rolled our, we rolled our rifle out, you know, everyone was like, well, why did you pick this? I'm like, because everyone's going to fucking change it. So just do whatever you want, right? Um, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm not going to try to guess what your fucking favorite color is. Just pick yeah. what you want, right? Um, <laughs> we ship them with my pole. Uh, go again. We run the CTR, we run the Magpul K2, uh, on it. Um, I mean, I like for true precision work, I like something a little bit thicker, uh, a fat, more tactile. Um, for carbine work, I personally don't like something that has like a beaver tail. I like to be able to get that high tank grip, like, I'm still just that dumb you know, oh, three dumb dumb uh, that came through and was like that high tank grip. I want that high tank grip, right? So, um, you know, at the end of the day, I, it's an extraordinarily personal preference because that is one of, you know, as you talk about the four points of contact, the ones that really matter, 
for you or how can you access that trigger? How can you access that safety? Um, and how can you deliberately plus straight to the rear? And so I, I honestly, if you want to run anything from, you know, the, you know, uh, and to Dwayne's point, any of the 400 Magpul options to a, an Ergo to a 3d printed, you know, MK something to whatever. I don't, I don't care if it works for you where you can, you know, deliberately press that trigger straight to the rear, access that safety immediately on and off, uh, and have it has enough leverage to hold the gun as you transition position to position, then I really don't care. Cool. So that brings up um a question about uh same side with the thumb or wrap around with the thumb too, because for general work or you know, when things are happening fast, moving position to position or whatever, I'll wrap. But when it comes to more precise work, I bring the thumb around to the same side and run ambi safeties for that reason. How's that go around the room? I'm, uh, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much the same way. Uh, I just looked at, apparently I run a K2 grip too. Uh, <laughs> if, we, if we're going to talk about anything outside of Magpul's 400 though, I, I have actually built a, a, like an AR with the uh, MDT oak grip or it was walnut, walnut grip. And I like it. it. It's almost like going back to like an older style <laughs> feel for your hand, just because it's, you know, it's, it's fucking wood and it, it feels really amazing. Uh, <laughs> I, even with doing the, uh, the wrap for most things and the thumb on the side for precision work, I still don't run AMB safeties though, because I've had two of them break on me. Uh, just for my, you know, acid sweat or whatever kind of beast that I am, it gets in there and corrodes all the stuff. I had two of them snap off and I just, at this point, I'm like, I'm going to stick to mostly Stoner's idea of 90 degree throw and, uh, you know, one side. I think that a lot of that comes down to what your length of pull is and what position you're in, right? So, because it really comes down to what is the comfortability of your wrist. You know, yeah. like sympathetic movement of the rifle as you press the trigger. It's a fucking rifle. You have four points of contact. It's not a pistol. Like, you're you're probably not moving it with your trigger press on one of these light two stage triggers, right? So like, to me, it's not one of those things of like, oh, I'm saving sympathetic movement by moving my thumb to the outboard side. No, it might just be it feels better, so you can actually press through without any sort of like weird impingement, and that's fine too, right? Um, I tend to run, or I try to tend to run with my thumb. I, and you'll catch me one way or the other, depending on how it feels from that position or what my butts, like we talked about earlier, buttstock might need to come in one or two clicks immediately coming from prone up to a position other than prone simply for eye relief. If that's the case, maybe my grip changes. If I'm driving the gun from one, you know, depending on the target set, you know, whatever, if it's the guns in constant movement or whatever, I'm probably going to keep that thumb wrapped. I want to control it the most. I think the grip matters more than anything. Now I teach what, we, you know, I call it a handshake firm grip. It's one of those things where it's like the way that I tell guys is it's like, you know, like a handshake. it's not, uh, it's not extra. Like you don't want to be that guy that's like, you know, trying to mongo it. But it's kind of like you don't want to be uh, the dudes like it's my strong hand, right? You want to kind of be like the first time you met your father-in-law, right? Like you had to let him know there was another man in the room. Like you didn't want to seem extra, but you want to let him know that that was yours now, right? And like that, you have to be able to control that gun, and that's way more important than thumb side or side. Eric, uh, I have this beefy ergo grip that looks like it belongs on the shelf of the only fans content creator. It's ridiculously <laughs> ridiculous. Um, I have been, uh, experimenting a little more, uh, because with the, uh, thumb on the, uh, fire on the, uh, trigger side, like the trigger finger side, uh, just to kind of see like what inputs am I putting on the gun? Uh, cause, uh, you know, I listened to Ash has talk about three tack 22.9, the army's TC for marksmanship. And I was like, let me try to rule out some factors. Let me see if there's a difference. And, and I think there's a difference. It, it causes me to focus a little bit more. Whereas uh, years of running fast on that uh, standard, you know, uh, Colt OEM uh, pistol grip, my, my hands, I got big, stupid ass caveman hands, right? Uh, that, uh, that A2 pistol grip is not quite beefy enough. 
like I there's like it's like I'm mashing the shit out of it. And I was like, I'll just do a hardware solution to a software problem to borrow that from uh, Chuck Pressburg. And I was just like, let's get a bigger grip. And I'm still on the fence about it. I might start looking at other options, but I'm not going to go too far down that uh, rabbit hole financially. But uh, yeah, just a. Uh, can, can I tell a dumb story about saving money on pistol grips real quick? Yeah, go ahead. So it, it wasn't a Magpul brand, obviously, or Dwayne would be over here fighting me. But uh, I did see, I had this happen. I had a, I bought a, a fatter grip from a different brand of company. I was, you know, testing stuff out, ripped it off mid stage. All right, going up a ladder with the gun like this. And next thing I know, I've got a rifle over here and a grip over here. And it turns out you can actually hold the safety in with your thumb and still shoot uh, an AR 15. But that definitely taught me something about uh, buying the, the $30 grip instead of the $35 grip. K2XL if you have big mitts. I think I have one of those. I, I think I've got one of everything you guys make actually floating around the garage somewhere. But Do you have any T-Mags? Because I can't find them anywhere. I was going to buy some at Magpul today, and as they were in my basket, they got sold. Second Cavity's uh, in the press right now. Third Cavity comes online next week. So apologies. Yeah, life. What What kind of cavities? <laughs> we're talking about your gun business Dwayne not your other business <laughs> what was that about OnlyFans what yeah. Yeah. Well, only plants you found me out third cavity is gold tier only but <laughs> Fred any any insights on, on grips no sticking no. to the sharps yeah yeah that <laughs> No, I, I genuinely would not be opposed to picking one of those up because that's yeah. just cool. <laughs> so what else, Dwayne? What else do we need to discuss? Uh, hardware on the gun or software. Well, I mean, we didn't. how much do we get into optics so far? I missed a bunch. Probably pretty good. Okay. Um, Clay would be a better... Clay, actually, all of these guys would be a better judge. I'm just here absorbing and enjoying. We uh, we did talk about it. We talked about you know LVPOs versus running like a more like you know a two and a half to fifteen or or a two and a half to ten or a three to fifteen, uh, which there's you know case that cases for. We we talked a bit about optics, but man, another opinion is always what's your what's your what's your your uh, your choice there. Uh, for something that's a dedicated SBR, SPR role, um, I, have, I have a two and a half to 10 kind of guy ish. But now that was before we saw the one day it's one to tens, things like that. But I'm certainly not operational these days. All, most of my guns uh, have an LPVO, unless it's a 10 inch or 11 inch gun at this point, just because I have a cataract replacement lens in my right eye. So it makes life a lot simpler. Um, I'm fine with second focal plane razor gen two one to sixes for a lot of those those choices, but I have some one to eight attackers and stuff like that. What about ammo? Mm. Ooh, spicy. All right. Let's anyone want to let's get ready to let's get ready to Mark two six two. I'm still a fan of the Mark two six two. So quite honestly, mm -hmm. I, I would say that in, in 2024, Mark 262, unless you've got a fucking awesome lot from yesteryear, is probably not your friend. It is no. consistently low performer. Mm. No. To Just, justify my poor choices, Alex. Thank you. <laughs> uh, is it uh, it accuracy, extreme spread? Well, accuracy, accuracy mostly. I honestly believe that like true Mark 262, like they're – uh, I think some of the either the maintenance on the machines hasn't been done correctly. Ooh, oh, dog. Ooh, that's, oh, that hurts. That hurts. It's yeah. not. There's a lot of other options out there now that are that are consistently performing better. But you know, from to every dude that I've talked to across, whether it's the SF Regiment, 75th Marine Corps, what we've seen with guys coming through the the facility, like uh, 262 is largely unimpressive compared to what it used to be. Uh, there are a bunch of good options out now. There's some really cool stuff coming down the pike right now with like the, you know, shell shock casings and the performance that those are pushing out. 
Um, but I, I, my rule of thumb for SPR is heavy for caliber as fast as you can get and as accurate as your gun likes to shoot it. And if you, those, are, those are the three things, right? So like, I like heavy for caliber because I want to see it. Like again, a ga but gas gun by definition is a shooter shooter weapon system. So I want to be able to self spot. I want as much splash as possible. I want it moving as fast as possible because I want the maximum danger space. And I want to be able, if I'm shooting whole pure holds in the optic, I want to stay as close to the center as possible or inside the first five mils up to 600, my operational envelope for that weapon system. Beyond that, I want it to be as accurate as possible so that if I have the mechanical accuracy of the weapon optic ammo plus me as the shooter, once I start to take things into account and I push things out to two distance and MOA capability with my extreme spread, plus or minus windage, plus or minus my wobble zone from position, uh, and then for most, you know, TDP spec AR-15s or whatever to include hot zero and positional shift, I want to basically try to keep all of that noise as small as possible so I have the most wiggle room on the plate or on the on the target to get the hit. I'm yes, say, uh, 75 grain horny match has been a consistent good perform for me, but we're talking that's still expensive. If we want to kick it down to the uh, to the cheap stuff, uh, I've actually had like really good success for not like you know I'm going to shoot my groups for record with this, but it's like uh, S and B seventy seven as well as uh, I'll mention sure it's an Australian company. It's uh, it's usually ADI. Cheap. Yeah, they've been pretty legit too for the uh, for the cheaper end stuff. Right now, for cheap seventy seven grain. I honestly don't think you can beat the AAC stuff. I haven't tried that one, and I, I, that's on my list of stuff to do, but I haven't shot it yet. Dude, it is fucking retarded. Like, it is putting out at, at whatever it is, 56 cents a round or something like that. It is putting down legitimate sub half minute groups over and over and over. Like, it's, it's, it's better than it deserves to be. <laughs> I saw like, 15,000 rounds of Magtech 77 grain, which is oddly, at least from the date time group that I purchased that is, uh, is crazy, uh, punching above its weight. So Clay, you mentioned the Hornady match. To include Supermatch and the, what is it, the red and silver oh, foil? Oh, man, I can't, I can't keep all their shit straight. Uh, I usually, my the 75 match I still have laying around is still the white box with the lead red ring that says match. Uh, I can't keep more really straight between their Superformance, Super, Super Superformance, Vermisformance, Vermageddon, whatever all the bullshit is. It's like Magpul uh, and all their grips. Yeah, right, yeah, like which color do you want? Uh, the, uh, the Superformance supposedly has some... Uh, some powder change that I think makes it a little bit better out of the shorter barrels, whereas the match should theoretically be best for like a, a, a bulk gun, but whatever, I still run it by hour. It's still fine. Uh, that one, I, I know that one's been good. And if we're talking like even cheaper stuff, like the, the Hornady American gunner, in my opinion, for like real cheap stuff, they don't make anything 77. The thing they make 55 and they might make 62, but the Hornady American gunner line has been very consistent for the money over the last couple of years too. Yeah, because I, I, in talking to friends who are kind of getting into it and they're not quite as dedicated, yeah, got this awesome rifle, got this awesome optic, and got the cheapest ammo possible. Yeah. Got that Herders, baby. Cabela's special. Go for it. <laughs> Some Sorry. American Eagle 55s, yeah. 53s. Here we go. Go, go black box with the white letters. Just go for On the horny side of the house, so one thing to keep in mind, this isn't necessarily for small frame, but for gas gun in general. So a lot like Matt, to your point a little bit ago about your boy running a OBR or yeah. gas fives, right? So that tap round, it, it isn't as prevalent. Like small, like large frame takes whatever problems small frame has and exacerbates them, you know, like by an order of magnitude. But one of the things that you will see quite often in large frame if they run tap is that that little plastic tip will break off and lodge in the lugs uh, of the bolt to the barrel extension. And it is an absolute nightmare. And it happens quite often in the large frame setting. That sounds spicy. 
It's not the best. I mean, it's a suboptimal outcome for. <laughs> well, you know, two back. I mean, back to two six two two. There was a time where, uh, God, what year was it? There was a time when two six two was blowing primers, and it would drop them into the trigger group, which was also super cool. So I, I am I. IMI 77, depending on the, how tight the chamber's cut, you'll see that a lot. Um, any one of those high pressure ammos, you'll start to see cratering, and then eventually you'll end up with a primary trigger group. Haven't there also been reports of primers in the trigger groups creating a full auto? Yes. Yeah, that does happen. That, that is a possibility. Oh, uh, I don't know if it can happen with a semi-auto gun, but I know it can happen with like a military gun with uh, either the burst feature or an auto load or whatever. It can it can jam them up. Yeah, burst, pass. Well, that's <laughs> that, that, yeah. In a semi gun, that's essentially what you get is 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 a burst because it you know will hold back the disconnector, but the timing ends up off because there's no sear trip. So you get a couple rounds that will go, and then you get hammer follow and. It stops. But yeah, it's just still exciting if you're not ready for it. Oh, it's sporty. <laughs> so, that's so why I'm, you need to be in a good position. Yeah. So, this is your right. recoil management drill. Yeah, that's right. I had, that happen on, I had that happen on an SR25 with uh, some of the, some, with tap. And I had a, I had a blown primer in a, in a 7.62 that uh, got four rounds downrange. That was, Definitely not expected. What did the group look like? That's what I was going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> We're judging you right now. Uh, there was there was right a, there. Yeah. If I had target, uh, you know, troops in the open in uh, uh, in uh, echelon, I would have been okay. But other than that, wait, it looked like a two four nine target. That's what. It yeah, yeah. That's two four nine target. So, what other aspect of this fine topic? Have we not addressed yet? Uh, magazines, to some extent, um, there is that an actual. It's a, it's an actual relevant topic, and you may or may not have seen that. But some guys have done some stuff. It's one of the reasons we skip the feed lips, or excuse me, the uh, feed ramps. Feed ramps. As, as, yeah, we don't skip the feed lips. We skip the feed ramps um, as much as possible, and that's why the presentation uh, angle on a P mag is higher. Uh, you can actually see from magazines with lower presentation, you can get two separate groups if you fire enough rounds uh, based on whether the round's coming off the left or the right side uh, feed lip. Um, and to some extent, I'd, it'd be interesting. We've taken a look at, and some guns are worse than others, depending on how, how fast the gun's cycling. If you get full, the amount of time to get a proper full stack size or stack rise and the round settles against the feed lips properly, it's less uh, significant than if you are running um, faster bolt speeds where you get sometimes an imperfect stack rise, especially as a, a, a magazine with a lower presentation gets dirty and it slows stack rise time, which is another thing we're big on is stack rise time. But um, uh, plat deformation as well as projectile scoring on the, the, the feed ramps themselves uh, is definitely a thing uh, that can occur. So if it is, it's an interesting thing is if you're, if you're running a metal mag or a different magazine, uh, try a P mag with and see what that does to your group sizes, especially at distance, you know, BC, BC differences based on uh, projectile deformation. So that's a huge thing on the super downrange side it, that people don't talk about is what's happening to those bullets as they get deformed because every bullet will have a slightly individual ballistic coefficient based on how it loads and what it goes from. The other thing that that Dwayne was just talking about in terms of like what side of the like what side of the mag it's feeding on. If you have substantial carrier tilt, meaning that your bolt carrier to upper or bolt carrier to uh, gas tube. Uh, has any sort of impingement or weird, strange thing, you're going to start to see those group left, right. They would basically get two groups, like a left group and a right group. Um, if you shoot on like an electronic target, like or 85 or something like that, you can actually see it in real time. Um, the other thing that you'll get from that too is, is a last round shift as you have no pressure on the bolt, the bottom of the bolt carrier with the spring tension. Um, but Dwayne brings up a great point about magazines. So this is something we teach in every class when I go over gun setup. So one of the things that I've been running for years 
is a 20 round PMAG with a plus five extension. And everybody thought, you know, everybody that kind of copied me and ran with it thought that it was because I only wanted to be down five rounds, but the reality was, uh, not that at all. That was just a byproduct. One was I wanted to be shorter than a 30 rounds so that behind a bipod, I could actually have elevation in the gun without bottoming out on the, the magazine to the rear. The second part of it is running SPR is reloading from a mag pouch. Any legitimate mag pouch, a 20 rounder will just get swallowed up by it. So having that extra plus five extension allows you to actually grab it and pull it um, and keep the gun fed. Something we haven't talked about yet is bipods. And I don't think we need to spend a ton of time on it. But one of the things that we like to run on our SPRs is a slightly taller than normal bipod. So we run a nine to 13 versus that six to nine. That is like this, the universal standard. And again, that is so regardless of, you know, even if you're at a hundred yards and in and you want to shoot somebody on the second deck, like you're going to need that extra elevation in the front of the gun and you can't have that 30 rounder back there. Right. So it, it, it all goes together in terms of like what your employment scenario looks like. So it's just something to think about all the way through with magazine selection, the how, the what, the why, and carrying the two all the way forward. Bipod height is 100% a good one. That's why, you know, the, I mean, ours goes to what, 11 and a half or 12, depending on your attachment method, is that the six to nines really um, shine on a bench. And other than that, field positions, if you have kit on, especially all that stuff, you really need a slightly higher bipod for almost everything that happens in the field. So you could have just said yours goes to 11. <laughs> 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 So I'm grab a guitar. The one thing that, the one thing that Magpul did do when they designed their bipod, and and anybody that, that knows me knows it's not my favorite bipod, but they do allow you to lock out the panning feature. And like whereas some others, more more expensive other options that pan don't. Panning is the devil for a couple of reasons. As that friction lock opens up, it's gonna start dictating or having an influence on in which way the gun jumps under recoil that's not under your control, one, two, and then by default, as it twists, it's getting narrower, you're actually losing lateral stability. So like for me, panning is something I absolutely hate. So I appreciate the fact that Magpul built in that reversible plate so you can lock that out because that's something that like should be done almost immediately when it comes to this sort of stuff. Agreed, we had a lot of people that asked for the pan, but it was like, man, there's so many drawbacks to it that we weren't gonna offer it hundred percent across the board. So the lockout was kind of a must have for us. I've been telling people for years and I'll put it out here now. If you want a million dollar business idea, all I, I would ask is that, you know, you just say, I gave it to you. I don't even want royalty, but like if you offer a pin and welding service for Atlas bipods, I think you'd make a million dollars. Love it. I love it too much. Hey guys, I hate to be this guy, but we've actually uh, run so long. I have another show coming up. <laughs> you can believe it. <laughs> I should, should, I so committed to. with that in mind then, before you take off, um, and I'll say my favorite thing, make sure you, as a listener or viewer, make sure you're supporting those sources that you have found to be beneficial. Again, if you like what these guys had to say, find them on social media, give them likes, follow shares, shares, especially if they're sharing stuff that um, winds up helping you understand something better. So with that in mind, we'll, we'll, we'll jump right into final thoughts and plugs. Clay, what do you got? We got, uh, yeah. So hey, I'm, uh, I'm Clay. I'm way up the res at, at Twitter. I've written six books, two survival books, kind of relevant for where we're at today. Uh, you can find them all on Amazon, uh, concrete jungle, prairie fire, wrath, the wind to go, uh, barbarian spirit, uh, that's where I mostly hang out now. It's mostly what I do is, uh, talk shit on Twitter and, uh, write books. Cool. And what are the names of the books? Uh, Concrete Jungle, Prairie Fire, Wrath of the Wendigo, uh, Barbarian Spirit, Last Son of the War God, and Sword of the Caliphate. And how many of them are fiction? Three. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So I go both ways, just like back in college. And, with you. and what about your sister? No, that's totally different. That's like yeah. the third way. Yeah, you got to try everything twice, bro. Make sure you didn't like it. <laughs> that's a Rich Mason thing. Um, Fred, what you got? Oh, um, final thoughts or anything? Thanks so much for having me on. That, uh, Thanks for joining us. That uh, 
just the guys here are are just man it's you know phd level employment and i'm just a wrench turner so i just really appreciate being able to be here i well, appreciate you joining us eric um honestly just get training i'm kind of slowing it right now uh, when it comes to the spr i've got access to 800 yards uh but i'm firing from an elevated position uh against the rocky mountains so wind is a big factor and i'm kind of learning the hard way uh mm -hmm. and there's not much out this way for scoped carbine so let's put it this way it would be cheaper for me to fly to new hampshire and go train with alex at ridgeline than it would be to drive three hours north and train in this region. So definitely get training. This has been a journey of self-discovery. Uh, but yeah, I don't have much else on that. Like I, I love this, uh, the versatility. Uh, he said Assaulter Plus and yeah. I really like that concept. So- uh, Not sniper yeah. light. Yeah, so uh, de yeah, definitely get the training. And honestly, I've been Googling, man. And I, I don't mean to toot Alex's horn, but the only thing I've really found is, is Ridge line. And I'm just uh, waiting to pull the trigger on that. So to speak. Cool. Dwayne. Look to, to magpool.com for all your needs for Magpul. any of these topics. We talk here. Yeah. You know, the yeah, you know, <laughs> magpool. I do some things there. I you know, take out the trash, whatever. And um, you're on their videos sometimes. And you yeah, narrate. It's long. And indeed once in a while. Um, yeah. But uh Big stuff there. We have we have something for everyone uh, with respect to the the human interface with the rifle, uh, and for just about every need. Every single one of our products uh, is tested to you know three two zero four five standards. You know full up and drops and and that whole deal. Um, and if you are traveling with rifles, whether it be for training, uh, operationally, professionally, or for leisure, uh, check out the storage solutions we have. Um, the cases and uh, for the existing cases you have, the DACA grid systems, reconfigurable uh, kind of storage and protection for your items as you travel around the world just kind of is a game changer. So that uh, you know, you can take that SPR out and put your SBR and a couple of pistols in there and um, change some blocks around and you're good to go. Good stuff. Alex? So you can find uh, all of our training stuff and, and everything we do at BridgelineDefense.com. Um, we didn't get into it, but uh, we have in the last few years developed what I would consider like the ultimate version of the SPR. We call it the RD-15 LPR, Light Precision Rifle. It is a hyper accurate, I mean, the stuff that we're doing in terms of quality control and understanding position shift, thermal shift, uh, carrier tilt stuff we were talking about. I mean, we are producing gas guns that are shooting 0.3 MOA consistently. Um, no positional shift, no thermal shift. Um, and they're they're out in the world right now. They're the top seat in QP right now. They're they're going to different places. And, and that's you and Reston together? So yeah, so Jared Jared came on board last year to help. He's going to run the LE side of that for us, um, and so he's taking he's he's running the law enforcement sales side for us on that, um, and we're rolling that out. But it's a the unique part that we have at Ridgeline is one all the guys that we've had for the last few years at our facility in terms of their backgrounds, capability, and experience with it, regards to sniping. Uh, but we also couple that with about 1,500 students per year of precision rifle students. So we're able to put that many guys a year through, you know, call it standardized course of fire, identify trends, figure out solutions, and then go hire designers and engineers that are that do that side of it for a living and build what we want as end users. So um, that that's unique in the fact that, like, we're not a corporate run company. We're a bootstrap company. We hire the guys to build what we want as shooters, and that's the product that we have to take to market. So um, it, it's been a unique project. I've learned a ton in bringing it to market in terms of the manufacturing side of stuff and understanding, you know, it kept me up for six months. How do I make, you know, a thousand that can do the same as the one, right? And, uh, and I think that anybody that knows manufacturing would think the same thing, but they are next level when it comes to gas gun we went with small frame first because a lot of the problems were solved for us 
we have other things coming down the pike, you know, um, now that we've figured out the problems that we wanted to solve as, uh, for gas gunners. Uh, and so we're, we're super excited about it. And, uh, anybody or anything, anybody wants to know, we've got a ton of stuff out on the social media sword. Awesome. Awesome. Um, going out to the listener, the viewer, don't be surprised if we have a sequel, a follow-up episode with this. I have reached out to Kyle DeFore. Uh, Ash Hess was in the chat with us, as was Steve Fisher. So don't be surprised if we have a follow-on. We still need to talk about cans. We need to talk about training. We need to talk about several other things that can be a lot of fun. Uh, most importantly, uh, painting them because, you know, y- you need to. <laughs> <laughs> but uh big thank you to the sponsors big thank you to lucky gunner overwatch precision filster primary arms walther lastly big thank you to the patreon subscribers um if you like what we do check us out at patreon.com slash primary and secondary patreon subscribers of five bucks or more uh get to watch these live they also get access to these uncut after they're done and i upload them you'll get the audio and the video formats completely unedited as well as without commercials um, typically the final product is released a couple days later. So this one will be released next week. Um, and it will have, it will just be on YouTube and then it will be on your favorite audio, uh, podcast source. That's pretty much it. Uh, you can find us at primary and uh, com. We have the forum, 736 different groups on Facebook. We have all kinds of fun stuff for you. Love being part of this, love being able to provide these kinds of discussions and be able to learn from these and um uh, that's pretty much it yeah still have so many more episodes to do so we'll talk to you soon